Awesome. Okay, we've got a ton of people in the class. Now listen. Some of you are really close to the 40 hours you need in initial training. Okay. In order to graduate and get your certificate and your shirt and your lanyard, which is graduation, you need 40 hours showing up in your initial training slot. Look at your VMS record has to have at least 40 hours in that slot. Okay. If like some people in this class, you have 40 hours of volunteer work and eight hours of advanced training and 40 hours in your initial training. You get certified. And when you certify, you get that 10. It's a beautiful, beautiful, and then it can look dry and fly. Okay. So does anyone have questions about how that works? Yeah. So once we hit our 40 hours of initial training, do we just start um, counting this as AT? Exactly. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Do we yeah. add on an AT or, or yeah. is it? I mean, you put it, it in as AT. It's not automatic. No. If you're not. putting it in <laughs> as initial training, <laughs> if you're putting it in as initial training, it goes in under initial training. Okay. So if you say, oh, I've been in 48.5 hours of classes already. So yeah. And put it all under initial training. That's where it's going to show up. It's not mm -hmm. automatic because of the four. Can we change it? it? We did. It. If it's already been approved, yeah. and everything's okay. Oh. Okay. All right. That's okay. fine. I have a question. Yes. If you, and this is, if you're going to do your second set of work, do you yes. have to also do a second set of advanced training? Yes. Okay, so you have to go from eight to 16 there. Exactly. And then 40 to 80. Right, and okay. that's called double certifying. And when you do that, you get this beautiful wealth pin, which I fondly call the pork chop. <laughs> it like, does, it does. <laughs> yeah, they, they showed it to us at every annual meeting. They showed the pin for the next year. And when they put that on the screen, I would turn the body on. Is that the pork chop? <laughs> <laughs> we had no idea what that was, so they said it was a welcome girl. Okay, that makes sense. But yes, you get the pork chop if you don't okay. deserve it. How so, long do we have to get okay. that? So at the end of the year, your hours start over. Okay. So yeah, we want to get your 80 hours like Jeff has 106. Oh, it's Jeff, you want to show me up. <laughs> <laughs> She's got 250. I know she gets, she gets three pins, but she gets <laughs> So, so yes, so she's gonna get the, she's gonna get the 250, which is the little bronze butter uh, dragonfly. She's gonna get the enamel dragonfly for certified, and she's gonna get her pork chop. Does the word overachiever come? Yeah, future president. So. So, but we need to we need to um, to use our time wisely today. So we're going to get started. Did you share your screen already? No, Carolyn. I have one more uh, thing I want to make clear, or let you make clear on the the timing on the actually getting your initial certification. Since this is your first Yahoo, then you have until the anniversary date of your first class to actually certify. So that's April one of next year to certify. If and you don't um, make certification by then, then you have to take the class all over again. Is that right? Um, we, no, 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 but you've got until then to actually certify. So if you're going, oh my gosh, there's no way that I'm going to finish it by December 31st, I'm just going to hang it up. Don't hang it up. Don't hang it up. Certify by April 1. April 1 of 2023. Can you double certify by then? You yeah, cannot double certify okay. by then because okay, and, and it's kind of weird because the um the initial thing is on just a, a 12 month thing from when you start. After that, it goes to calendar year. And so that's why the initial, if you double certify, then it all has to be done by December 31, because that certification is on a calendar year. Does that make sense? And then after this, it's on a calendar year. And to do that double certified, you have to get the advanced training or the um, volunteer hours. Yes. Two and two. yes. Yeah. Both. Yeah. Both. So you need 40 of each. No, no. you would need 40 and 40 and 8 and 8. Or 12 and 12. Eight, 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 eight advanced. And 40. No, 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 no. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The wrong one. And yes, ma'am. We have another certified after. Yes. Yes, ma'am. 
I'm leaving the first to move to Maryland. Oh, okay. December. That's right. Okay. So, yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, absolutely. I'm going to try really hard. Oh, come on. That's just a, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Right. Oh, that would be yeah. beautiful. I'm excited. Yeah, I get to read it all over again. Okay. <laughs> all right. Okay, so that makes sense. Okay. Oh, but it's still showing the right thing. Okay. But is it on here? Um, what you need to do is go into your Yeah. It's just really this is what I want to share. This is what shows up. Yeah. 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 So before we get started, do the is anybody on Zoom or they able to see my screen? Okay, they're good. Thank you, whoever requests. Thank you. Oh, and real quick, yeah, I think Mom is probably hot right now. And eat lots of bananas. Yeah, no, Justin's not here. Justin's not here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to this wonderful day without rain and without 100 degree temperatures. It's just almost like fall out there, isn't it? So, how many of you have ever taken a, a hike? Okay. Probably going to get another one today. Terry, don't take it down the rabbit hole, please, when you do the motion. Oh, come on. Uh, how many have been on a picnic? Yeah. Gone camping with your family or friends. Uh, uh, so if you go outside, it renews your spirits. It connects you with nature and the amazing beauty of nature and the many natural wonders of your world. Well, there's a national movement run by a nonprofit organization. It's called uh, the Leave No Trace Center for Outdoor Ethics. And they're dedicated to protect, protecting the outdoors by teaching and inspiring you and other people to enjoy it in a responsible manner. They accomplish this mission by delivering cutting edge education and training programs to millions of people across the country each year, kind of like I'm doing today. Uh, my name is Andre Nelson. Besides being the treasurer for uh, Hartwood, which you'll come to you know, know me next year, uh, I'm also a uh, uh, Leave No Trace state advocate for the state of Texas. There are two of us. We're the only state that has two. I've just gotten a new designation that we used to both be called just Texas State Advocates, but now we have a South Texas State Advocate and a North Texas State Advocate. Guess which one I am? <laughs> uh, so the center addresses the impacts and gives people techniques and skills to enjoy the outdoors in a sustainable manner, both now and in the future. <laughs> Thank you. Bless you. Okay. Let's try it this way. Oh, I have somebody to admit folks, sorry. Now we'll try. Okay, Mr. Tech. Yes. We tried it a minute ago. <laughs> All right. So that's what I've just talked about. Sorry. All right. So why do we do that? So nine out of 10 people who visit the outdoors have never heard about Leave No Trace. They're not informed about it or anything else. Can you believe that? Have you all heard of it? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, y'all are naturalists. <laughs> Most people who go to the woods are not. They're out there just to have fun, right? 
There's over 13 billion trips in the outdoors in the U.S. every year. That's a lot. Huh? Uh, so when they do that, people are causing a lot of preventable damage, and that damage is starting to add up. How many have ever seen a trashed area? Fire scars at a campground. <laughs> Got outside their campfire already. Damaged trails. Other impacts. Uh, you know, we pay $2.9 billion a year to fight fires in parks and forests, just like these folks out here do. 80% of that are caused by campfires that are left unattended, or burning debris, or throwing out cigarettes. The wildlife in your parks are routinely re relocated, and some cases have to be euthanized uh, due to conflicts with humans. National Park Service cites human garbage as the origin of many of these unfortunate and unnecessary acts. You know, when you go to the national parks and, and, and places like uh, Yellowstone, that right now isn't open, but some of the others, if a bear comes into your camp, they'll move it once. Same thing at Philmont Scout Ranch, which I've been to a couple of times. They'll move it once. If it comes back into camp again, that's a dead bear. Mm -hmm. We're causing that. Wildlife that get human food can lose their fear of humans and develop attraction to behaviors of trails, picnic areas, campsites, and visitors. How many of you got to see coyotes in your backyard? There's two reasons for that. One is us moving in and taking away their habitat, but the other is leaving garbage and stuff out, things for them to find. Uh, I recommend, by the way, if you have pets and you think the fence will keep the wildlife out, go to uh, Channel 11 or Channel 2 and find a, a video they showed about three days ago where a uh, coyote just jumped a six-foot fence onto the top of a, of a building oh. and went into their backyard. And they will get bulldogs and things smaller for sure. Oh, here's a good one. Invasive species are being spread nationwide. Y'all heard of that, I'm sure, in some of your classes. Uh, by moving firewood from one area to the next. Many new infestations of non-native tree-killing insects, like the uh, emerald ash borer and some others, uh, often first found in campgrounds. They vary by region, the diseases and stuff, but some have already killed millions of trees over thousands of acres. And this started years ago, even before I've heard of the match match when we helped the Dutch elm disease, and you know, there's other things, you know, the, like I said, the emerald ash barrel. Trash lasts a very long time. Plastic grocery bags can last up to 20 years. Aluminum cans up to 100 years. Fishing line up to 600 years. I have a good friend who tries to collect fishing line. He puts, he builds little PVC pipe containers around, puts them in all the lakes and places where people fish and encourages people to put them in there. And he goes to the, uh, he works with the Texas Parks and Wildlife, and when it comes to places like uh, uh, expos and things, he comes with his trailer. And the last time I saw his ball of fishing line, it was, it was almost as tall as this room, wow. and about half as big. Wow. So, uh, according to the CDC, one day's pet waste can contain several billion fecal chloroform bacteria, along with giardia and the eggs of roundworms, hookworms, and tapeworms. Good morning, and what's for breakfast? <laughs> Uh, recovery rates for areas that are impacted by recreation are often very slow. Restoration of natural conditions can require 10 to 30 years at a minimum. So leave no trace, in our opinion, is the best way to minimize these and other impacts. And how do we do that? We educate people. Uh, so what kind of impacts are there? Well, if you go in the outdoors, we generally impact the environment in seven different ways, seven broad categories. First, you have wildlife impacts. We disturb them. We alter their behaviors, both intentional and inadvertent feeding. It's, don't drive through the parks and feed the bears or the, anything else out of your window. Don't take selfies with buffalo. You might end up on YouTube or the National News. Uh, we, we reduce their health and sometimes we reduce their reproduction. There's also soil impacts. You lose organic litter, you, uh, you cause the soil to compact, and there's, we cause erosion. Vegetation impacts. There's vegetation loss. We introduce invasive species, like I've already said, and we have tree or plant damage. You know, when I was a kid, people used to carve their names in trees 
A H plus C D or whoever we you know, and, and that kind of stuff. I hope we don't do that anymore, but sometimes people probably still do. We have cultural resource impacts through theft or damage to cultural and historic features and artifacts. Uh, did you know if you go to the petrified forest, it's against the law to take a piece of petrified wood out? Now, you can go outside the gate and buy a piece that they've taken out, but that's, we won't go there. <laughs> but it is, you know, it's still, whether you buy it at the, at the, at the store or, or illegally take it out yourself. And by the way, they will search your car. They will, they know, they'll ask you a question when you go out and you got anything. Else. And they'll look at you and they'll probably pretty much guarantee if you've got something, they'll figure it out. And then they'll search your car. And then you got problems. And then we have campfire impacts. You got large damaging fires. Like I said, 80% of the wildfires are caused by cigarettes, uh, campfires, and, and similar things like that, burning. Uh, we deplete areas of all dead and down wood. Now, anybody in here been involved with scouting at all? I was. Okay. I was a parent. Okay. If you go to a, a many of the older Boy Scout camps and you go to their campsites and you look, there aren't any limbs on any of the trees up to the height of where you can stand one scout on the shoulder of another and have you reach up there with a saw and cut all the limbs off. <laughs> yeah, that, that just happens. And you'll see similar stuff in state parks where other people do that too. Uh, burn trash and food. People people burn, try to burn their trash and their food and then they leave it in the campfires and it doesn't ever get completely burned up. And then there's always the risk of wildfire. Water resource impacts, which Terry, this should be near and dear to you. Yes. We have siltation, we have sedimentation, there's trash in them, there's soap in them where people just go down there and wash their dishes right there in the creeks and the ponds mm -hmm. and so forth. And there's fecal waste, primarily because people are too close to the water when they uh, do their business. And then we have social impacts from other visitors. There's crowding, there's conflicts between various user groups. A diminished outdoor experience. I'm 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 a, I'm a trainer in scouts. I used to be a scout master. Now I train other scouts, scouters, and we always got blamed for everything that happened in the woods. When I say there's conflict between other groups, doesn't matter if it's a church group. Anybody that had youth, we got blamed because we why scouting is the biggest youth group in the country. It does outdoor stuff. So public land use in the U.S. Look at the number of people with public lands each year. Remember I told you there's over 13 billion uh, trips to outdoors every year. It's great so many people, it's, that so many people spend time outside. We're not asking them not to do that. But it also means there's many opportunities to make an impact on the outdoors. Recreation, recreation related impacts, the public lands are individual, but to accumulate over time. So if you think about that, it's not the one time that one person cuts a switch back or throws away an apple for it. That doesn't, you know, one time's not going to make a difference, supposedly. But think about all the one times added together. That's what really makes the impact. And so when those actions are repeated hundreds and thousands or millions of times, then you, be, then you see what you've seen with trashed out areas and things like that. The implications of outdoor use can be staggering especially when you think about the popularity of outdoor recreation on federal and state land. According to federal and state data uh, that you can find on their websites, that's what they say. So think about what happens when even more people come to a park. The potential for recreation related impacts can increase significantly. So there's a bunch of people, a typical park scene, a nice park, grassy fields, a hardened parking area, and easy access to water. But then all of a sudden, people find out about it and you get more people. So when people show up, what kind of impact do you think can occur? Lots of them. The water can get polluted. If they can build a campfire to cook their hot dogs and stuff and leave trash and things like that. So all of that. So if you think about leave no trace as a spectrum from between few impacts and significant impacts. Uh, on one end, many. On the other end, very few. Your, your job is to find your place on that spectrum. My job, same thing. If you do anything at all to minimize your impact, it's better than doing nothing at all. Which leave no trace in a bunch of rules or regulations or black or white. Like I tell people when I teach this course somewhere, 
and, and I do teach uh, trainer courses, master educator courses. I am a lead no trace master educator. The two most important words in lead no trace are not even ones that they talk about, and it's it depends. Because how you interpret the seven principles that we're going to go over in a little while depends on the situation you're in. Okay. Uh, and I'll go into that when we go over. But it's what we need to, we, we need to do what we can to minimize our impact. So if you pack out your trash, you left no trace on, the, on one, on one uh, of the principles. If you picked up after your pet, you left no trace. Oh, and please don't do like this. There are people who go out and walk their pets on the trails. They'll pick up the poop, put it in a bag, and then leave it for someone else to leave it on the side of the trail or on a fence post for someone else to throw away. Finish the job. You've seen, seen that. You've seen that. Yeah. Yep. Or they leave it at the sign over here in the forest. Yes. Okay. Let me see if there's anybody wanting to be admitted. So, uh, if you've done both, if you if you take it taken after out your taken back your trash and picked up at your pet, you've even done better. So the cumulative effect of all those good stewardship actions is how you protect the shared land. Think of the difference on the public land if everyone puts leave no trace into action. So leave no trace is science-based and data-driven. Data-driven in its approach, whether it's conducting their own studies, drawing from the findings of recent research, they use empirical data to ensure strong education programs, high-quality training, and sound best practices. Existing leave no trace scientific literature aligns to the disciplines of recreation ecology. Anybody heard that word before? Recreation ecology. And the human dimensions of natural resources. Well, recreation ecology, it's a field of study that looks at the impact of visitors to protected areas and, <clears throat> and is the underpinning for <clears throat> leave no trace messaging because it focuses on recreation related impacts. Excuse me, just a second. It's sinus season. So they recently begun an approach <laughs> to explore leave no, leave no trace related behavior, uh, which is consisted mainly of visitor observation coupled with paired survey data. So in other words, what they're doing is they'll survey people and say, what would you do if, and then they watch them to see if they really do what they said they would do. And, they, and so that, that helps them to, to uh, focus their message and how, how to get it out and help people to uh, find a way to leave no trace. So there are seven principles in leave no trace. And the first of those is plan ahead and prepare. And we're going to talk about each one of those just a little bit. Take a little break here. Yeah. So plan ahead and prepare. So if you think about that, Every time you do anything, you should plan ahead, right? Because if you don't, plan ahead. You'll end up with something like this. <laughs> I hope you can see that at home. But planning ahead can involve a number of things. The first thing is, what do you take with you when you go out to the woods, whether it's on a hike or camping trip? or in a nature study, whatever. There's a few things you need to do before you go. You need to have enough food and water to, 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 for however long you're gonna be there, right? Uh, I always take a first aid kit of some sort. I have one here, uh, but that's okay. Doesn't have to be a big one, just a few band-aids or something, you know, in case you do a boo-boo while you, you, know, you fall and scratch your, your knee or something, or. If you have a, a puppy with you that's four months old and he still likes to bite. <laughs> By the way, if anybody has a German Shepherd puppy, I would like to take uh, uh, advice. Uh, you need to know where the nearest medical facility is. You need to know if if uh, what would happen if, wait, you need to know if you want to do a hot lunch, is it okay to have a little fire so you bring a little stove? Because sometimes you're going to be out there all day long. You may not want to just have a cold sandwich. So you need to know if the water is drinkable there. So if it's not, you need to bring more with you. Okay? Those kinds of things. 
travel and camp on durable surfaces. We're not talking so much about camping unless you're out there doing a week long field or a weekend field study, but hiking on durable surfaces. Now, what do you think that means? Stay on the ground. Stay on the ground, yes. Stay on the trails. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, a durable surface uh, is usually something that when you step on it, doesn't leave a footprint. Uh, not always true, but let's 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 take some examples. Uh, this path that goes down to the uh, parking lot here—that's a durable surface. Okay. Uh, out here on the grass, if it's regular grass and it's cut short, yeah, that's okay. Uh, you don't want to go uh, 30 people single file across it because it will leave a big trail if you do. So if you go across that, and especially if you go across a meadow, you need to spread out. And a good good way to trip, test that out is when you're at home, uh, get get your family or a few friends together, find your grassy area and walk across it, single file, and see if you can look back, see if you can see a path. You will if you get enough of it, and then spread out and walk back, and you won't see a path. Or another way to do that is just before you mow your grass or have it mowed or however you do that, go out there and step on the grass eight or nine times. The first three or four times you do it, this grass will spring right back up. But at about time number six, seven, eight, somewhere in there, it won't. You're beginning to make a trail. So that, that's not really a very durable surface. What about snow? What do you think about that? What, so we don't have down here much, but uh, if you were up north uh, and you were on snow or you're up in the mountains, you think that's durable? Trick question. Yeah. No, it depends. <laughs> right answer. But yes, it is. It is a. It's considered a durable surface because it will melt, and your footprints will be gone. Yeah, uh, sand is is somewhat similar because if it's out in the desert, the wind will blow away your your presence. Uh, there, there's something though they call cryptobiotic soil that <laughs> you should never step on. Have, have, how many been out west and seen the wagon tracks? Yeah. Those are made in cryptobiotic soil. That's why they're still there. Cryptobiotic soil is not dirt. It's really a bunch of organisms that live out there. Tiny, tiny little organisms. And if you step on it, you kill it. Okay. Um, a swamp. What do you think? The center says it's not durable. My answer is, if it never dries up, nobody's ever going to see your footprint. The problem is, if it does dry up, then you flip. You know, so I guess we should go with there. It depends. Um, so you're going down the trail, and you see a mud hole. What do you think you should do? Go through it, Jumbo. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> Absolutely right. And why? Because if you go around it, you're starting to make the trail bigger. Now, if you've got little kids, they're going to love that part. Uh, Especially yes. if they've got clean white tennis shoes on, right? Yeah. And then when they get home, moms and dads aren't really going to be so happy. But, uh, those are the sort of kind of things you need to think about uh, when you're out do, doing your thing. Now, as, as a nature person and you're out doing research, sometimes you can't avoid getting in, in non durable areas. Like you may go look for, I don't know, mushrooms yeah. in, in a place that's off the trail. So when you do today, don't follow each other single file when she, if she takes you off the trail. Spread out so you don't make as much of an impact. Dispose of waste properly. Oh boy. Uh, there's three kinds of waste. The first is if you're out camping and you have dishwater and stuff, you, you, you have soapy watery waste. And the only thing I'll say about that is Before you dispose of your stuff, the water, you really need to strain, before you even wash your dishes, you really need to strain all your food, okay? So put some water in that dish, strain it, it because all that food stuff is trash. You can, I made this out of a Frisbee. Uh, I carry it when I go backpacking. Sometimes you play with it, it kind of wobbles because of all the holes in it, but it's still fun. Uh, or you can do something like this. You can make a, this is just a piece of window screen with some duct tape. That, that's, that's really lightweight. Uh, or you can just go down to the dollar and a quarter tree 
and get one of those three packs of, of strainers and use that. Uh, the, the, key, the key element there is to put all that food in a plastic bag and take it back to the home with you because it's trash. And it's the right way to dispose it. Once you've done that and you wash your dishes, it's okay to broadcast it out into the woods. People get shocked when I say that, but uh, what little soap there is in there, I would recommend using a biodegradable soap, like hemp soap or something. But even if you don't, what little is in there is not going to hurt anything if you product this. Uh, so that takes care of the water. Then there's trash. Well, the easiest thing to do <laughs> to avoid taking trash to the woods is to not even take it at all. I mean, to have it not to bring it back. And how do you do that? Well, as an example, and I know we're not probably talking about eating breakfast in the woods, but this is a good example. Uh, when you buy a box of cereal, There are three things in it. There's a box. There's a wax paper bag. And there's a cereal. What do you want? <laughs> you want the cereal. So put it in a Ziploc bag. Ziploc bag is not trash until it has a hole in it. You can keep putting more cereal in there if you go camping a lot, or you can come home and wash it. They are washable. I do it all the time at home until they get holes in them. They use them over and over again on fridge bags, unless they have chicken in them. I don't eat those here. Uh, raw chicken. So, same thing. If, if you're feeding a large group of people and they would have sandwiches for lunch, or even if you're just taking yourself, don't buy one of these. Buy a big bag and put them in either. Either a Ziploc if you're by yourself, or put some gloves on and serve them. Because what happens with these is invariably they're going to tear off that part and then that part. That's called micro trash. How much of that ends up in the trash? Not a lot of it. Probably with adults like us, more than if you've got a, a group of children. But still, not a lot of it. But if you got that big bag and you put it in a Ziploc and take it with you, that's not an issue. Uh, and then we have human waste, and, and we won't go into a lot of that, but you know, when you're out doing nature stuff, sometimes you have to relieve yourself. Well, first thing is uh, urine is not harmful to vegetation. No matter what people tell you, if you have <coughs> a thousand people and they all urinated in one spot, then yes, that might happen. But, you know, one one person urinating on a tree or a bush is not going to hurt it, okay? And the Leave No Trace Center will back me on that. Yeah. We, we just, you know, if you really feel bad about that, there's ways to contain that and bring it back. Uh, you know, when, when, when I was in Iraq, you know, at night we went to go to the bathroom and we didn't want to get up. It was cold, you know? <laughs> it's 28 degrees. So we would use an empty water bottle. The problem with that is you really need to be careful if you get thirsty that you get the right. <laughs> so, so you, you, if you're doing that, make some kind of X or something in on the lid. So, you know, just something to think about. But also, if you're ever in a cave, you're not allowed to urinate in a cave ever, 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 ever. They are too pristine. So, you'll have to have a bottle or a container of some sort if you go down in a cave. So, uh, solid waste. There's a couple of things you can do. The first is to dig a cat hole. Anybody ever heard of that? Besides so scout people? Uh, cat hole's a little hole about four to six inches uh, across and six to eight inches deep. I might have that backwards. So, yeah, six to eight inches across, four to six inches deep. Depending on, you, you want to dig down far enough that animals won't get it, but you don't want to dig so far down that you're going past the uh, organic soil because then it won't decompose as quickly. And then you do your business, and then we, we ask that you bring your paper out. It's not hard to do. If you had a dog, you all turned a plastic bag upside down or inside out on your hand and picked up the dog food and done it. Do the same thing with the paper. And then you just put it away. There's other things you can do that uh, they make devices that you can take with you so you don't have to dig a hole. One's called a wag bag. They've been around forever. It has uh, two plastic bags. It has a 
tiny little bit of toilet paper that if anybody ever been in the military years ago, uh, this is what used to be in sink rations. Um, but this chemical renders this uh, waste stuff safe to throw in a dumpster. It's the only kind of chemical, that it's some kind of disposal means that you're really supposed to throw in a dumpster so to use this chemical. Uh, the common name for it is poo powder. I think it was developed for NASA, so. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. You're right. Just like Tang was. Right. <laughs> uh, this is an example of what poop powder looks like. It's just a powder, and I'm going to pass this around. I'm going to soak it all on first. And then I'm going to show you what it does. No, I'm not going to. <laughs> 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 I'm going to use water. Uh, find a little plastic bag. Uh, a little plastic bag. There, there it is. Okay. This is what it looks like after a couple of years. Uh, the water in the in the pool. There it is. Well, that's my powder. Very I'm gonna take a long time to clean up that one. That's okay. We're gonna take a break between anyway. So It doesn't take very much of this, this stuff. Uh, it's a little bit expensive. You get a jar about this big for about 80 bucks. It lasts forever because it doesn't take very much. You make smaller jars. So I'm going to put a little bit of, you know, like a spoonful of this stuff in here. That wasn't very much expensive. There. And you're going to see, you're going to be amazed. But how quickly this works. Back away from the computer in case I spill it. Oh, you saw it. That's just water. <laughs> so, so I always have one of those in my vehicle, one of those wag bags. It looks like this. There, there's several different iterations of it. This is the one that from years ago. And inside this bag, there's another bag. I mean, there's two bags. There's an exterior bag and an interior bag. There's some of that poop powder, and it's already in the interior bag. And there's, like I said, a small amount of paper. Uh, you do your business in the interior bag, and then you put it in the exterior bag and carry it. Uh, if you have extra powder, you can use that exterior bag more than once. Uh, this is what one of the interior bags looks like. You see it. Yeah. <laughs> that makes it easy to use. <laughs> and you can see carefully that there is poop powder down in there. So pass that to you. You don't want what? that on. But no, does it just make it solid or does it kill germs? Or both. Okay. Yeah, both. It, it, it encapsulates it, so to speak, and, and, it, and it's perfectly safe. Uh, according to the EPA, you throw this in the landfill once that's done. If you go into a lot of national park areas or uh, wilderness areas, they will tell you at the trailhead you're required to have a wag bag and carry everything out. Or a blue bag, and they'll sell you the blue bag. Okay. And, yeah. and I was going to say that because a lot of them now will not let you dig holes anymore because yeah. there are those 13 billion visits a year. These parks are starting to fill up with holes. <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. So now they, like any of the, especially the federal ones, will require you that if you don't have your own white bag or your own way to carry it out, they'll make you, they'll sell you a little blue bag, they call it. Uh, there used to be a um, an outhouse at the top of Mount, I think it was Rainier, and they would spend like three grand a day going up there. They had to clean it out every day. Oh my gosh. And so they so had to fly a helicopter up there to do it. Oh. And so they finally got tired of that, and so they demolished it, and that's when they started doing the blue bags that place. Now it's just going on and on. Just too many people going out there digging holes. Uh, I always have one of those with me. There's a couple of other iterations of it. Where do you buy these? 
Like, does REI sell them? Or do you yeah. REI will sell them. Yeah. Uh, this one is called a Biffy bag. It's the same thing. This one is called Restop. It's the same thing. Re Restop actually makes a number one version and a number two version. And you can imagine what they're for. Uh, I've never had cause to use the number one version because, like I said, you know, doesn't hurt anything. But you can get them at REI, you can go online and just uh, Google white bag. Uh, you can go to the lngcenter.org and buy them. Just about any outdoor place will sell them. Uh, you can probably get them in a category. Yes, sir. So if this is what you're going to do to make it safe for this in trash, how come we don't have to do that with dog poop? Dog poop has a different kind of pathogen. They, they normally are not as deadly to humans as humans are to do ourselves. We have, they, they, our pathogens are probably the worst out there, and especially for human exposure. Uh, you really ought to, you know, you, you don't have to do it. You want to, you can, but there's no requirement that you do that. So, Next one is leave what you find. Okay, so think about this: you go out, and you go out, and you see something that's really nice. And now, Terry, if she finds it more else, she's going to eat it. I am. <laughs> but but if you find a flower or, or something that's really beautiful, or a piece of petrified wood, or, or or a nice rock, or something like that, and you pick it up and take it home, what happens? Nobody else can see it. Nobody else can see it. Have I been guilty of that? Absolutely. When I was at Philmont Scout Ranch, they have a they have a mountain that's sort of full of mica. I brought some of that home when I was in Iraq. I brought home three little, five little, seven little, something like that, Tabasco bottle full of different types of sand. Now, well, the ag department took that away from me when I got here. They didn't want me bringing it in. That's partly a good thing, even though I would have never unsealed it. But, you know, they don't know that. But so I've done it. Uh, my leave no trace training partner, who's a guy named Bruce Hanley, you know, he's he's a Texas master naturalist. He just didn't come up here much, but he lived down in South Texas. Uh, he is a geologist, and before he became leave no trace, he would collect all these rocks. So he's got when he moves from apartment to apartment, he's got you know he has to pay a premium to the movers. Uh, he probably should get rid of them, but you know, geologists can't do that stuff. But he doesn't do it anymore. So so you know, somebody said just like you said. Nobody else can see them if, if you take them. So if you think about it, it's kind of like this puzzle. You can see the whole thing, right? But if somebody comes along, to find which one it is, and takes part of it home, then suddenly you don't get the full effect, right? I'm hoping you all can see these things at all. Uh, so what do you do? The first thing you can do is take a picture. The next thing you can do is she's going to talk about in a little bit is write it in a journal. Draw a picture of it. Or, you know, tell it how it makes you feel in your journal. But leave it. Please don't take it home. Minimize campfire impacts. This probably won't do, have much to do with uh, master naturalist studies, but if you do go camping, it will. Uh, you don't always need a fire. You know, one thing about scouts, and if you were on the thing, you, if you've ever heard of seen an old age ceremony, they think they got to have a fire as big as a person. Anyway, order the air. That's a supposedly a, a, a camping uh, super society or something like that. But, you know, whatever. They, they also use uh, things to start fires that they're not supposed to start, they're like diesel and stuff like that. But you don't need a fire. There's three reasons to have a fire one is to stay warm. One is to cook food, and one is just to have find the office. Well, first, staying warm, a big fire is not going to keep you warm. You're going to get roasted on one side while you freeze to death on the other. You know, Native Americans had it much better, so did, so did the, the pioneers, or not pioneers, but the mountain people, mountain men. You build a small one, you can stand right over it and kind of get all warm. Same thing for cooking. If you cook on a fire, you have a giant fire, it's going to just burn on the, all your food to crisp and it won't be done in the middle. You want coals, you don't want you don't want a big fire. And then ambiance, you can do that without a fire. You can do things like 
use a candle lantern. You can take these things, hang it in a tree, light it, and pretty soon, especially if you got like two or three of them, it's just like having a fire. You sit around, tell stories, or whatever you want to do, or just stare at it if you're by yourself. <laughs> Well, I like to do that. Yeah. It's kind of calming. It's kind of like when I get up in the morning, which I don't get to do often, I sit on my patio and watch the sunrise and drink my coffee. Usually I have to go to work, so I can't do that. But, uh, I couldn't have today, but I was coming here. <laughs> or you can, or you can, you can get a solar type lantern. This is a solar. I haven't opened it. It's a solar lantern, and it expands like that. You can get a kerosene lantern. Yeah. Or you could use a Coleman lantern, but they're kind of bright, so that kind of takes away from the ambiance. Um, some people like to get colored gouging bottles and put uh, headlamps. headlamps inside of them. And so you can have blue and green and red and yellow lights out there to stare at. So there's a lot of things you can do that, 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 that don't uh, require a campfire. But if you do have a campfire, the things you need to remember. Make sure everything burns up. Those little black pieces of thing that you see in there, I call them nubbins. Those are trash. They will never, ever reburn. But uh, you can take them home and put them in your charcoal uh, grill if you want. But if you leave them out there, the only thing that would happen is after about 10 million years, we had an earthquake and they got down in the ground and there was a lot of pressure, they might turn into a diamond. Oh. <laughs> but other than that, they're trash. So they'll make, if you burn everything up till it's gray ash, then you don't have that problem. If you can't, then take them with you. The gray ash, it's okay to scatter that. Uh, not one, don't dump it in one place. But you know what we, what I do is I'm walking down the trail, having a bag, I just got, kind of, you know, like that. That's okay. It has nutrients in it that aren't bad for the plants. Actually, are good for them. So those are the kind of things. And if you got to have a fire and there's a fire ring, don't build it somewhere else. It's there <laughs> for a reason. That's where the land manager wants it. Land managers are responsible. In this case, it's the forest guy here. Uh, and don't ever, without asking the land manager, tear down a fire ring because there are three of them in one area because maybe he wants all three of them there. But anyway, things you can do about uh, minimizing campfire impact. Respect wildlife. If you're making an animal change its behavior by what you do, then you're too close to it. And I was taking my master educator course at Belmont Scout Ranch. We, would, we, we did three days in class and then four days in, in the woods. And we we're walking down on our going to the woods, and there's some deer way off in the distance, I thought. And I had my hiking poles, turned the guy, person behind me, I don't know if it was a guy or girl now. Picked up a hot well, look over there, and they all scattered. Oops. So, yeah, right off the bat, I violated principle number uh, six. There's a, there's a rule of thumb. If you can hold up your thumb and completely obscure the animal you're looking at, then you're okay. And if you can hold up your thumb and see part of that animal, you're too close. That's a, that's a good thing to teach younger people. And it's a good thing to teach older people for that matter. Uh, be especially careful around wildlife if it's time for them to be eating, if it's rutting season, if they have children, uh, or if you're at Yellowstone Park and they've got horns. <laughs> <laughs> Part of respecting wildlife means don't leave your food out. And don't put it in your car because bears can get in your car. I have a friend who was at, at, at a scout uh, training session and he had a brand new pickup and he left his food in his pickup, brand new, and a raccoon chewed all the little rubber around. Oh, he, 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 wow. His first time he'd driven all around the driver's <laughs> road. Didn't get in, but he had to go down and get that replaced. Brand new pickup. Those things are smart. Raccoons are very smart. They have, they have uh, opposable, thumbs. opposable thumbs, so they could do a lot of stuff. Yeah, they actually pushed all of our bins out from under our picnic table 
and opened all the vents. Mm -hmm. the yep, 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 yep. <laughs> yeah, putting in the putting wow. putting the cooler putting that. the cooler <laughs> under the seat of the picnic table doesn't work. No, no, no. We took some new scouts to uh, uh, Kings Lake State Park one time, and I told them before they went to bed. A brand new scout, never been camping with a scout troop before. The big Cub Scouts before that. I said, "Put your cooler in the trailer." We locked the trailer up at night. They didn't do it. So the next morning or the next day at lunch, they're arguing. I go up there to see what the deal is. Well, Billy forgot to bring the meat for the sandwiches, and I look on top of the cooler lid. Raccoon tracks. I open the cooler and there's empty uh, <laughs> container of where you know ham and stuff used to be. The package. I said, Billy didn't forget it. Y'all just didn't put your stuff up. Uh, luckily, the, the adults had. They always carry a jar of peanut butter, so they didn't start. But, uh, you know, <laughs> raccoons are smart, just like she said. And you got to respect wildlife. Part of that is saving them from themselves. Okay. One way to do that. Yeah, I don't have it. They used to have a system, and it still works somewhat. It's called a bear bag, and you put your food in a bag, and you raise it up, and it's got to be like at least 12 feet off the ground, and at least 10 to 12 feet from any tree. The problem is, bears are smart. Bears have begun to figure out how to get those down. Well, I don't know how they do it, but they're doing it. So now they make uh, bear balls. Mm -hmm. they bears do not have opposable thumbs, and you cannot. And raccoons are too small. It's one of those kind of like those adult-proof medicine bottles. You can't you can't get the lid open without using both hands because there's something you got to hold down while you while you uh, unscrew the lid. And or there's another version that you got to have a screwdriver or a quarter or something to unlock it. And, and they'll hold. They're kind of heavy. But they'll hold, you know, a whole weekend's worth of backpacking food and that kind of stuff. Uh, so far, they, there's no proof that bears have been able to break one of those. They've thrown them against rocks and things like they're made out of plastic, but it's real hard plastic. So they've not been able to do that yet. Yeah. <laughs> that time will probably be coming. A lot of places, though, a lot of the parks will have like a bear box. It looks kind of like a, a, a dumpster, only maybe smaller, like half size. And, and it's got a steel lid and it's steel and there's a padlock on it and things like that. Bears will figure that out one of these days. Uh, but for now, that's what you do. Is you, you don't put it in. Do not leave it in your car. Do not leave. Just certainly don't leave it in your tent. Most of the, if you ever see a, a story about someone being attacked in their tent by a bear, nine times out of ten, I'll guarantee you if you read deep enough, you'll find out there was food in that tent. Or residue from food. They ate in the tent or they stored the food in the tent, something. So respect wildlife. And then finally, be considerate of other visitors. Yes. So, where do you put the food if you don't have the things that open the border or the bear bag? You don't get those. Don't bring it all in one night. <laughs> okay. You, 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 you could probably, if you have a trunk of a car, you might be able to do that, but be prepared for them to go through your window and try to rip out the back seat. Yeah, I just saw that. Sorry. I had, um, there was one, God, this probably 15 years ago, that these two guys had gone out camping, remote camping, and um, they did everything right except one thing, and they did not change clothes after cooking around their fire. Uh, and one of the guys got thrown out of his tent by a bear and killed. You know, yeah, that you know, if you if you're if you spill something on yourself while you're cooking, if you're using a lot of spices and things that'll get into your, yeah. absorbed into your clothes, think about that. Uh, some people sleep in a different set of clothes than they wear during the day. I've and, heard that about a, a, a granola bar that was in a pocket. Yeah. Yes. I've heard that. and yeah. had been taken out and eaten by crumbs. Yeah, they put the paper back in the pocket. Yeah. You know, you know, and, uh, he keep talking about film on, but they have something out there that's even worse than bears. It's called mini bears. It, it's what they call chipmunks. Oh, yeah. and, and we were up top of Mount Phillips sitting there at about, I don't know, 11,000 feet. And heaven, these things, these mini bears, if you lay them or run them and grab it while you're sitting there eating something else, mm -hmm. they did that. And they're no longer no bars. <laughs>
So, so yeah, they're just yes. You have to be aware of all times. Think about what you're doing and make it as safe as you can. Right. Okay. So, Andre, if you do have a bear canister. If you're backpacking and you have a bear canister, where do you put it? Where you go there? Not in the tent. It, no, you just set it out of what, you know, away from your tent. And they won't feet, walk away feet. with it? Huh? And the bear won't walk away with it? They, they, they will not, they'll, you'll, you'll have to go look, you might have to go look for it the next morning, <laughs> okay. but they won't, they'll give up on it because okay. they can't get it open. Okay. Yeah. So I have a yeah. You can move, you can move a long ways. Yeah, that's what I would do. Don't throw that down the floor. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, so, I feel really uncomfortable trying to rope to it. What do you do about the squirrel? So I, have, my child has actually been attacked by a squirrel at Huntsville because people do the squirrels in the dating this area so much. You know, as far as protecting your child, I don't know the answer. The answer is not to feed squirrels, right. but you can't help what other people do. I understand that. Uh, just, but how do you keep them like bill tears or anything? <laughs> they won't get into a bear bag. They won't get into a bear bag. Or, I mean, a bear, bear, okay, so they're not going to take that for I'm going out for the day to just go picnic and hang out in the day use area. And so, like, it might feed birds. That's no. yeah. one problem, you know what she's talking about. Yeah. yeah. And they make these so called squirrel proof bird feeders that don't work. Well, people always talk about don't feed the bears, don't feed this, and those are dangerous don't animals. Don't feed any but, animal. Right, but it's, how do we stop people from feeding something as insignificant as they think a squirrel is? Education, education, yeah. education. That's all you can do. I mean, and so part of what I'm telling you today is so you can help educate other people, okay? And then finally, be considerate of other people. This is more This is more for camping, but if, if you've ever been in a state park, Oh, huh? My bad. Couldn't help it. I'm listening in. Is that okay? I'll mute myself again. There That's fine. Please mute. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, nothing worse than being in a, in a state park or somewhere and having somebody either next to you throwing a party all night long or coming in late at night and scouts are bad about this on Friday night, mm -hmm. unloading their trailer real loud, things like that. Uh, So, so you just be aware. Also, you know, try to avoid if you don't have little kids with you wearing bright colors out there. Don't ever have music playing loud. You know, if you got to listen to music, put put in earbuds or something. Now, if you got little kids, you might want to put them in bright colors in case they wander off. Uh, things like that. But but just re realize you're not the only person out there, and so everything you do affects someone else. So I'm gonna. Stop right there for about five minutes or so, maybe 10 at the max. We're going to take a quick break and then we'll come back and finish this up, okay? Yeah. What do I do when I take a break? Just leave it on? Or... Okay. So, Andre. Yes. Um, you mentioned, Adrian was telling me that there are hand signals for each of these. We're going to get there. Okay, good. Because I think that's the fun part. We're going to get there. That's towards the end. Okay. Uh, there was a thing about making food, so, so obviously they moved to the, the other stuff instead of that. No, this is a Charlie Ford. Charlie Ford was a scout. Okay. Go on. Scouting is a victory of William Craig. And the reason he says to do that is to get it on the yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I can bring that up. Yeah. Yeah. Because, because there's some thought that it might make it be So, so that's still yeah. acceptable. Yes. Yeah. 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 I enjoy it though, it's fun to teach them. Yeah. Yeah.
All right, now what? Now what? Definitely got it in here. Now what? Can y'all hear me? Can y'all hear me? Somebody muted me. Carolyn. Carolyn. Somebody's asking some talking. Okay, I'm talking to you. Yeah. I'm talking to you. I'm just messing with you. I don't know where it's set up, but I'm gonna you know Miss Amanda? Yeah, yeah, when we Can you see me? Yeah, I think I see the only thing that looks like that? No, The volumes can be so close. Anybody know Miss Amanda? there are a lot of folks who do a lot, um, but, but you know, know there's this old saying that there are yeah, old mushroom hunters and there are the old mushrooms, but there are no old bold Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And so I was walking and I just seen all these red specks and the lips. And I walked up there for a and I was like, oh my God, this is my room. Wow. You have my email address. I'm pretty sure you have my email address. Because didn't you come to one or two of the water specialist class? Yeah. Yay. So you have my email address. If you think of it, send me the you know, what? I know. I know. We've got 13 high schools that have gotten certified since January. Because they, you know, they, if you're under 18, it is so tough to sign up for PPWD. So I collect their hours and I do their certification. 13 percent. No, it doesn't transition. <laughs> Yeah, and this still, thing, it's still this high. thing here. This is this is like I brought. Now let me tell you, this thing was. I mean, some of them, some of them were just been around. Yeah, you know, not over here. I know we're gonna, and I don't know what this guy did. He started with that. But then the main guys are in it. So the main guys are in it. So what you can't see here in your photo is the main guys. Yes, I know. Because it usually turns out as a photo. But um, if it does, that is that is always a dead giveaway that it's here tonight. So, well, there was a talk about it. Yeah, it's like how can you start talking to me? Well, well, I don't know what they are. So, the problem is, we're going to have to do something else. So, you have to, you have to, I'm pretty certain that I just showed you are edible, but you know, with caution, and the problem has like an explanation. Yeah, when it first came out, they had a lot more something else. Free fried stuff. And he said, peaches and strawberry and stuff. So I couldn't start that cup. So we were in the military. We would have this game. We need to dry and drink water and see what it's like. So it's a little bit. No, they didn't. 
Yes. Yeah. Oh my God. Not, not, I, I exaggerate. Right, right. But you can feel it. Okay. Feel it. Yeah. Oh my God. Okay, let me get them. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, welcome back, everyone. Before I move on, I want to cover a couple more things that somebody brought, one of the person brought to my attention. And we'll go back to human waste disposal and the cat holes and how they work. First, I didn't show you what you need to have with you if you plan on digging a cat hole, which is some way to do it. So this was the one, the proverbial orange trowel that everyone used to carry. Uh, you used to be able to get these for like 90 cents if you bought several of them. The problem is the company that made these sold themselves and the company that bought them doesn't make these anymore. So, you know, the other thing we do now is we we run down to Home Depot or somewhere and buy these Fisker's garden trowels. You used to be able to get those for a dollar and they would come in and periodically, you know, the problem with those is periodically people would come in and, you know, they get 40 or 50 and all the garden clubs would run down there buy all of them before we could get there. Uh, so you go online and you can pay as much as six bucks a piece for these, but you can also still find them for a little over a dollar if you buy 50 at a time, which we do. Well, I do that for my training courses. I like these because this, this little thing will come out and you can roll up some paper and store in there and take a video. Of a lot of people don't know, know that. Or, you know, they make one. <laughs> they make them out of all kinds of this is titanium for, the, for those of you that like lightweight and strength. Uh, this one I made myself from uh, REI snow tape oh. and some electrical tape and a cork. But I got a bottom of water. Well, I drink wine, but I got this. I happened to get this at Walmart because I wanted a bag of them. And, and the only reason the cork is there is to protect your hand. This works pretty well. The best thing you can use, though, is it's it's a shovel or, or, or a trowel of some sort. This is one that we gave. I taught a master educator course down at Seedley uh, uh, here about four or five years ago, and we gave these to our participants. It almost looks like a spoon, doesn't it? <laughs> one of our students made some chocolate pudding. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's still alive. It, it, was, it was new at the time. Oh, good. So, so, so you you got to have a device to dig the hole. But then there was something that, that, that was kind of tossed around in, in, in scouting more than anywhere else. It's called making poop soup. And, and it's, it's, it's once you use the hole, it's a way of pushing a little dirt in. By the way, your trowel never touches anything but dirt. Okay. It never touches the poop. So push a little dirt in there, get a stick, kind of stir it around. If, if you can't bring yourself to bring the paper out, please bring the paper out. But if you can't bring yourself to do that, put that in there and mix it all together. The reason you mix the dirt and the poop is because it might make it biodegrade just a little bit faster. And then you cover it up the rest of the way. Use a stick to cover it up. Don't use the trowel. You don't ever want to use that trowel for anything to dig in the hole. Okay. And some people like to take a stick and stick it in the ground up, you know, just stick it in there by the hole. But that's a signal to other backpackers don't dig here. Uh, I don't know how many know that trick, but if, if, you know, if you want to do that, it certainly doesn't hurt. So that was a follow up to that, what we just finished. So, back on that, back to it. So the research shows that Leave No Trace Education is successful in improving people's knowledge 
about practices, and these, these are the results of that research. There used to be six of them years ago, and we, we've added the one about being, being considered to other visitors. Uh, research indicates that education fosters healthy, depriving wildlife and fewer negative interactions with humans. It reduces litter. It causes less degradation of native plants and animals. And it causes stronger human bonds to the outdoors and a greater sense of stewardship. We continue to study at the center and test the principles, the messaging, and the training to ensure the most uh, effective, relevant messaging and programming. Uh, the developer of the backcountry will leave no trace today is relevant for anyone who spends time outdoors. It's appropriate everywhere from deep wilderness and backcountry to your local city park. Please don't dig a hole in your local city park. <laughs> <laughs> always use always use whatever's available. <laughs> if there's a restroom, go use it. <laughs> if you do, don't tell them I said to do it. <laughs> so what began as, as a call to preserve wilderness areas has really evolved into a global daily commitment for people to embrace a leave no trace effort. Environmental stewardship promoted by the center extends beyond outdoor enthusiasts to include anyone who enjoys the outdoors and is concerned with people's relationship with nature. So how did they get started? So you gotta understand, to help other, figure out how they work today, you gotta kind of understand where they came from. Back in the 60s, the, the idea originated in the back country in federal designated wilderness areas. We followed the passage of the Wilderness Act in 1964. Uh, in the 70s, the federal land management agencies developed and shared a basic leave no trace concept on the lands that they managed. And then in the 80s, the No Trace program was developed first by the USDA Forest Service uh, as, a, as a humanistic approach for wilderness ethics and low impact hiking and camping practices. Early names for the program included Wilderness Manners, and some of you may be old enough to remember this. I am. Uh, wilderness ethics, minimum impact camping, and no trace camping. And in the 70s, federal agencies began to develop educational brochures teaching the public about leave no trace. At the time, it was a slogan based program with little, very, very little national leadership or interagency coordination. So everybody just kind of operating on their own. And in the early 1990s, leave no trace was selected as a name for an expanded national program. Partnerships were formed with four federal uh, man land management agencies and the National Outdoor Leadership School. Oh, somebody heard of that? Mm -hmm. and then in 1993, there was an outdoor recreation summit in Washington, including the feds, uh, outdoor companies, and the national government organizations. They recommended a new, no, a new nonprofit to manage a national program. So in 1994, the Legal Trace Center for Outdoor Ethics was formed. Today, they partner with more than today they partner with more than seven hundred companies, lab agencies, schools, universities, nonprofits, outfitters, and guides, and their constituents to promote leave no trace. There's over thirty five thousand trained volunteers, educators, and members across the country to provide local leave no trace programs. So, what began as a wilderness education program is now relevant from deep back country to urban parks and protected areas, anywhere people live and enjoy the outdoors. The ultimate goal is to uh, educate everybody who loves the outdoors. That's an enormous goal. The fastest way to get there is to focus on sources, the land themselves, as well as on you. So the center focuses on two major initiatives. First is leave no trace in every park. The second is leave no trace for every kid. Leave No Trace in Every Park focuses on public lands, including local, state, and national parks, forests, and protected areas. If your local park is not participating in Leave No Trace, talk to them. They're always looking for new partners. And then Leave No Trace for Every Kid focuses on introducing the basic Leave No Trace concepts to kids while they're forming their personal ethic framework. And in a little bit, we're gonna pass out some cards and give you the principles of Leave No Trace in three forms, and the yellow one, it's written really simply for children uh, under age 12 to easily understand. And so that was one of the things that, that came out of it was Leave No Trace for Every Kid. So to ensure that uh, Leave No Trace is reaching communities, we're also training the public. 
building of a volunteer network and conducting research. Hmm, I missed one. Oh, there's a okay. Oh, no, there it is. Leave No Trace has multiple strategies to reach people. You can see they, they use the media, they do land management partners, websites, social media, youth programs, uh, partnerships with uh, retailers, manufacturers, outfitters, clubs, signage and education in parks on public lands. A group called the Traveling Trainers. Traveling Trainers is a group of four people that they send out, they're sponsored by Subaru. Subaru is a big partner with Leave No Trace. And these people are hired by Leave No Trace. It's a couple usually. Uh, uh, and they, uh, they spend all year driving around camping. Can you imagine? Their job, they have to spend at least, at least 270 nights a year in the woods. But they drive to different places and teach events. And, and, and show up, and you have to schedule like four months in advance to get in the car. Not a lot. But they furnish everything you need. You drive around a little Subaru cross track, it's got a thing, things on top of all the camping gear you need, and, and so forth. Uh, they, they, we got, we were able to get a group of Leave No Trace trainers down to the Klein School District about five or six years ago. There, there was a lady down there that, that taught a Leave No Trace course outside her normal classroom curriculum, like before school, after school. And she got them to come for a day and we went, I went down there and participated with them and we took them through a bunch of exercises and things like that. Those people are now retired. They usually after three years, they move you out and just get somebody else. Sometimes they'll let you read it. Uh, but they're a good thing. They're a good source of, um, they're a good source of reaching people. They have online training. They have writers, outdoor authors, bloggers and so forth. I will go to this one that keeps trying to pop up. So the partners include federal, state, and local land management agencies, corporations, NGOs, schools, and universities, outfitters, guide services that carry the program millions of, of their visitors and customers and students. Thousands of members and volunteers are key partners. Uh, most of their uh, partners domestically and are, are both domestic and international. They're the ground troops to support the education research and outreach. So there's more than 700 active community and corporate partners that are critical to overall Lebo Trace efforts. Their dues paid. On average, a single community partner reaches 1,100 people each year with formal Lebo Trace training. Uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife is a community, is a, is a partner, they're not a community partner, but they're a partner. So it's Boy Scouts of America. Uh, community partnership is the best way for nonprofits, colleges, universities, and small businesses, cities, clubs, outfitters, and guys to publicly demonstrate their support for the uh, Leave No Trace movement. Companies, uh, largely in the outdoor industry like REI and so Kent Moore and others, uh, they support the Leave No Trace mission. And they join as corporate partners to lend their support and voice to the movement. Sometimes you'll see if you get the REI uh, list of classes and stuff, they'll have Leave No Trace classes down there. Uh, and there's corporate partnerships that have been responsible for funding high impact programs like the Subaru uh, Leave No Trace Traveling Training that I just talked about. Uh, state advocates, uh, that's me. I get a budget every year by charge and stuff. Not much, 100 bucks a year, yeah. but uh, it helps. Actually, if I'm doing an event, they can send me a boot kit and that doesn't count against $100. But I get 300 cards for free. So, uh, Every, they try to make sure that every state has a volunteer coordinator and educator. By the way, in addition to being the state Southern advocate for Lee No Trace, I'm also uh, I have a new position in scouting. It's a volunteer, another volunteer position. It's called Lee no, or Outdoor Ethics and Conservation Zone Coordinator for Zone 7 of the scouting district. They replaced a bunch of areas and stuff in zones. Basically, it means I have responsibility for providing legal trace support to 10 councils across the southern part of Texas. Uh, so, members and volunteers 7,500 members, more or less, probably more now, over 35,000 volunteers. And they're, the, they're the on the ground advocacy for legal trace. 
They support the tra training by uh, providing education, outreach, and training in their communities. They make financial contributions to the work, and they rally uh, the troops on the ground. And then you have federal, state, and local partners, land management partners. They play a critical role in providing information to millions of people each year. Currently, the center has formal partnerships with the five largest land management agencies. They provide leave no trace education on public lands. I can't name them all, but it's Bureau of Land Management, Forest Service, uh, Fish and Wildlife, and a few others. <laughs> Corps of Engineers. Or, uh, I think that's one of them, yeah. They, they certainly got their logo up there. I don't know what they're on. National Wildlife. National Wildlife. Okay. Wow. It's on one of those. So, anyway, they have national leave no trace coordinators and collaborate the center. Uh, they have formal partnerships with all the country's state parks through the National Association of State Park Directors. And then local county and municipal agencies also partner with Leave No Trace to incorporate the program on the land they have. Are you listening? I am. All right. So, training and education uh, that helps support the mission and ensures that all outdoor enthusiasts have the skills to leave places as good as they found them or better. There's a multitude of options for courses, workshops, online training, outreach, and leave no trace literature guides. So there's really basically three times of training, an awareness workshop, 30 minutes to a full day of introductory workshop. Guess what? This is one. This is one. <laughs> longer than 30 minutes. Less of the day, but longer than 30 minutes. Then they have a trainer course. That's a two-day field course that results in a certificate of completion and it, it, a minimum of 16 hours of class time. Uh, typically, you have to, uh, you're asked to spend at least one night in the woods. You have to present a, a, on, on one of the topics of the seven principles, and you're judged on that, you're graded on that presentation and given advice. Most people don't fail. You, you, you have to try to fail. And I've had some youth go through a trainer course, almost got there. <laughs> because they'd rather play football. You know, when they're out camping. But, but, but we managed to even get those folks through it. So you, be, you become a, a Leave No Trace trainer and you're a, you're a trainer for the rest of your life. I became a trainer in 2005, 2003, somewhere like that. And I liked it so much, I went on and took the Master Educator course a few months later. That is a uh, five-day field course. And, and, and it's basically trainer course amplified. Uh, you do the same type of stuff, except you learn more about each principle and you learn about teaching uh, skills and things like that. Uh, and if we're able to teach trainer courses. The trainer can assist us, but if you have a trainer course, you have to have a master, edu master educator in charge of it. Okay. Trainers can go do the awareness workshop. Anybody could really do an awareness workshop, but you like to have a trainer do it because they got more formal training. Um, typically, we do we do presentations in, in the trainer course of presentations five ten minutes in, in the in the uh, master educator courses for like 30 minutes to an hour and for some reason i don't know why every time i've ever done a, a, a presentation trainer course master educator course it's always been on human waste disposal i don't know why <laughs> uh, they send you your they send you your topic in advance oh. and, and so so when i took my master educator course that, that if you go online you'll you can google it and I didn't bring it, I just had it. Uh, you, you find something called a poop tube, and it's made out of PVC, and you do your business in some other torn or fashion and put a paper bag or something. But then you store it down in these poop tubes and carry it with you. And that's for like if you're on the river or somewhere where you can't get rid of stuff and you've got to bring it out and go be on there for several days. But online, it says to take this, I made a model when I did my course, because I didn't want to carry all that weight backpack. So you, you'd never be able to use it without the bigger out. I have a real one that's that big out. But on the online version, it says to put a screw-on cap on each end, just, and just a complete cap, and glue, the, glue them, you know, glue one of them down, and then take the other one off. And I got back, and I got to thinking about it. And so one of them's permanently attached. Okay. You need to clean that out. So the best way to do it is with a garden hose. If there's a permanently attached thing on the end of it. <laughs> so I built the real one with screw on lids on each end so that you could unscrew it and wash it out the other way. 
So if you ever decide you need to build one, keep that in mind. Somebody didn't think that through when they did it. Okay. The, by the way, there's over 50,000 Lake No Trace trainers uh, worldwide, and there's over uh, nearly 11,000 master educators uh, in the U.S. And, and abroad. They have online learning. Uh, it's taking an online awareness workshop. It's it's you, so you can do something. It'll it'll be a, a little bit less of the history and stuff, but not much. Uh, but it'll be similar to what I did today. You can do that online at lng.org. It's designed to convey general leave no trace knowledge. And anybody 12 or older can participate in the online awareness workshop. Why 12? Well, because they do talk about some things under 12 probably wouldn't understand or would laugh and giggle and stuff, right? Human waste disposal, which also includes disposal of, of, of feminine products, too, and the right way to do that. Uh, so, also, if you're an existing master, master educator, Every two years, I have to take an online uh, refresher course to be able to teach. I can still be a master educator. I'm a master educator until I die. But to be able to teach, every two every two years, I have to refresh it. I think it's, I have to do it in January. It's in the odd years that I do mine. So. I used to teach a trainer course. I can still do the learning workshop. Without me. But how can you get involved? First thing is learn. You're doing that today, okay? Take advantage of the organization's broad selection of skills video. If you want to find out anything at all about Leave No Trace, go to YouTube. The LNG channel has got little one and two and three minute videos. Shows you how to dig a cat hole. Shows you how to purify water. So all these things, how to how to be uh, how to reduce campfire impacts, and they're not long at all. Uh, how to build a, a campfire on a mound, a, a mound fire, so that you don't kill the soil under you. Or a fan fire, and I didn't even go into that today. So, read the Leave No Trace Skills and Ethics book. They have those online now. You used to have to buy them. They're putting a lot of this stuff online for free now. You can download it. Uh, they take you through Leave No Trace for various ecosystems and outdoor activities. There's, there's a stack of them this, this thick. There's about 20 of them. The, the main one you would want to look at is uh, Skills for North America. They have them for I don't know, river rafting and all kinds of stuff. And then, of course, take the online awareness course, like I said. Next thing you can do, if you want to, is join. It's not really expensive. It's like 30 bucks a year. You get a 10% discount on everything you buy from their, their store, which almost pays for postage, or at least it used to. Postage rates are going so high, probably doesn't now. But uh, it, it, it's, not a, it's not a bad thing to do. You can also uh, introduce a kid to Leave No Trace through Peak Online. And PEAK is, I don't remember what it stands for, but it's something to do with kids. It, it, they have little activities, uh, and it's a binder about this thing, activities that you can do with people. Some of them are for all ages, adults, but most of them are like teens and below to introduce the principles to them. A lot of them are really fun. You can become, listen carefully, uh, all you people that run the, the uh, BMI stuff. You can contact the center and become a citizen scientist to get involved with leave no trace monitoring in your area. We have never done that, We've never had it approved. But if you want to do that, you contact the center, find out the details and give them to them. I bet you get approved. Because, you know, it's in our area and it's science and it's, and it's so just find out the details. I've never done that because I spend too much time training. Join the movement as a member to support what you care about, and be in the know about the latest science, Encourage your organization or company, Terry, to become an official partner with Leave No Trace. And I'm going to be talking to the city parks. Yeah. Here. Any group can get involved. And you can also join the 180,000 plus strong, active, engaged social media family on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, and probably, probably TikTok. I don't know. I, this, is really, <laughs> this is pretty three or four years ago. So who knows? Facebook's really good on it, and Twitter is too. Uh, so I don't do much. I don't do anything on Snapchat. And the only reason I use Instagram is because I can get pictures of my grandkids that way real fast. <laughs> so what else can you do? Pass it on. Share the Leave No Trace, even a simple principle with other people when you're enjoying the outdoors. Contact your Leave No Trace state advocate. That's me. Uh, 
to learn about opportunities to teach others in your community. I don't know my state advocate email because they just changed it because they, it used to be we would both get uh, the same email, both North and South, and they redesignated this now. But if you go to lng.org and Google State Advocate, you can find it. Or if you need to get me, you can just go A Hauser, A H O U S E R, and yahoo.com. Or you can get, and you can reach me through the website for National Naturalist, too, because I am the treasurer, and I'll, find, and I'll answer leave no trace questions that way, too. So, uh, forward the videos from YouTube, educational blogs, and more. It's really easy. So what we want you to do is enjoy your world by leaving no trace. Now, moving on, back to the seven principles. A real easy way to remember. First of all, can somebody pass out these cards? One of each to everybody. As I said, I'll talk about these real quick. This brown card, is the original leave no trace principle. So basically for backcountry use out in the wilderness, the white one is more for, for uh, front country use like in a state park or Boy Scout or Girl Scout camp. And then the yellow one is, like I said, they, they made it simpler for kids. And I'm gonna go off the kids version a little bit. Okay, so you. the first, and we're going to use our fingers to help us remember this. And there are seven principles, right? And so the first one is plan ahead and prepare. Or for kids, it's know before you go. So how do you think you can remember that? Know before you go. Right? Everybody do that. Know before you go. The next one. Travel and camp on durable surfaces or choose the right path. Two fingers. Walk along the right path. Next one. Uh, trash your trash or dispose of waste properly. So, two ways to look at that. You need to dig a cat hole or you can throw your trash in the trash can. Okay. The fourth one. Respect or uh, leave what you find. Okay. This is difficult. Oh. What are you doing? Take a Taking a picture. Yeah. Absolutely. Number five, be careful with fire. Oh. That's the flames. Number six, respect wildlife. <laughs> <laughs> and number seven, be considered by the breeder. So visitors, peace, but hello. <laughs> so we're going to go through those. Go so before you go. Choose the right path. Trash your trash. Leave what you find. Be careful. One thumb up, one thumb up, one thumb down. It's hard to do the first time. It really is. Um, be careful with fire. Watch out. Watch respect out. wildlife. Respect animals. Respect wildlife. Yeah, respect wildlife. And then be considerate of other visitors. Hello and peace to you. So and that's a way to remember those. Okay. Now we're going to do a couple little things. This is an ethics game. We're going to talk about the things that grind our gears the most. So there's going to be a slide, and there's going to be three things that other people might do that goes against leave no trace best practices. And each of us is going to have to vote on the one we think is worse. For the local floor and parks. There are no right answers. We're just checking our own personal ethics. Because every, like I remember, it could be in. So the first one, range carved in trees, a hiker passing while talking loudly on a cell cell phone, or cigarette butts discarded on the trail. So who thinks cigarette butts is the worst? Yes. A bunch of people. How about talking on the cell phone? Yeah, yeah. and names carved in trees. Yeah, I do too. That's more permanent. So, so, so this one was the cigarette butt, but it was a close, right. close call between that. And, yeah. and there, like I said, there are no right answers. There are sometimes I do this, and people don't like the cell phones. 
half burned food scraps and trash in a fire ring, a person hiking with their pet off leash, a person picking flowers while hiking. How about picking flowers? <laughs> it's bad, but is it as bad as the other two? It might be to you, and that's fine. Everybody's got a different perspective. Person hiking with their pet off a leash. Yeah. And half burned food scraps and trash in a fire. Ring. Ooh, that's, that's no brainer. You know, when I was a scout back in 19, <laughs> they taught us to do this. They taught us to burn our trash. We'd open both ends of a can, flatten it. The fire when we're done burying. Sometimes the fire is still burning. We also <laughs> dug trenches around the tent because getting the water out. We don't do that anymore. We're still back into that porch. So we also used the campfire to cook our food. So one time this guy had a can of tamales for lunch and put it in the fire, but he didn't open it. Oh, so about 15 can of tamales, he didn't oh. open it. About 15 minutes later, they opened themselves. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but nowadays, I, I think back on what we were taught to do, and it was it was the right thing to do at the time, based on the knowledge that we had. Remember that, that you can figure out how old I am because this was about the time that, that, that even the, the program even got thought of back in the sixties. Okay, so so or mid sixties. So anyway, Can I yes, because um, we're talking about pets. What we okay. Have. And actually, I'd like to pose this to everybody, to everybody in the room, a question. Okay. Um, so I'm an ambassador for the Bayou Land Conservancy, and there are people here too, and we take care of the trails, we get trail maintenance, we maintain, and I do bird walks, and I'm walking along, and there are people walking their dogs without a leash. And we have no way of policing or telling people what to do, but I've asked, I've, I've usually said to people, thank you for keeping your dog on a leash when they do. Or when they don't, sometimes, I don't know what to say because I've done it different ways. I've said it different ways. And I like to kind of have a consensus because some people own dogs and they do have them off the leash. Um, there's good. a sign that says right there, dogs have to be on leashes. I mean, this is a natural area, and sometimes I'll try to explain during the nesting season there's ducks, and I try to be nice, but how do you get across to people? The best way to do it, go to lnt.org and search Authority of the Resource. There's a whole article on, on the best way to present that. You can you can be good, and they, and they, and they use it in the context of, of, of a land manager telling people, you can't do that because I've got the star and I'm going to write you a ticket, or you can go up to them and explain to them, you know, when you do this, this is what happens and so forth. If, if you'll go there and read that, I think it'll give you yeah. some good ideas. I, I've done that. People get belligerent. And people get. And, and sometimes, know. sometimes you have to you walk away. To a blah, blah, sometimes, stuff and do that. That's right. Sometimes you have to walk away. It. It's like never it. good. We don't ever ask you to put yourself in danger. But sometimes you will get to it. And you can tell usually within the first few right. sentences how it's going to go. Did you say authority of the resource? Authority of the resource. Yeah, because some, I've tried to nicely say like this birds are migrating, sometimes they're nesting, mm -hmm. it's a sensitive area, you know, to please respect that we, I, I understand your dog loves to run, but, you know, and I've had people like jump down my throat. There are just you some know? people who don't care. They yeah. just absolutely don't care. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately, yeah. unfortunately, you see more of that today about everything. Yeah. It's, there's too many people that think yeah. everything is for them yeah. and no one else yeah. and don't care about anyone else. And, 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 and that's just the way it is. And, but there's a better way to present it, but it, it, it's often not going to work. Authority, of the, authority of the resource. Oh, of, 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 and that's on LNG.org. Yeah. 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 Okay, IT guy, I'm locked up. Here. Thank you. IT guy. I don't have any more control. So, 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 Okay. All right. Number three. IT guy on the certificate. Human waste piles along our trail and riverway. A cultural area picked clean of artifacts. 
or mountain bike ruts on the designated non-biking trail. Oh, I like that. Three bad Mountain bike ruts. <laughs> Cultural area fixed clean of artifacts. Uh -oh. Or human waste piles along a trail. Or a I could tell you that when I do this in, in, in a trainer course, we have a lot more questions than this. These two, A and B, are usually, and we, we go through them until they get down to their very last one. Usually, are in the last three or four that be there. Yeah. Or that they continue on. So, I'm you this. I, I did want to ask this question later, but it might be good here. If I'm walking on a hiking trail and a mountain biker is coming close to ahead of me, am I supposed to like kill myself to get out of his way? <laughs> You'd have to ride away, but you know what? He's faster than you are, and he's got a bike. <laughs> so, discretion is the better part of our. The walk, well, over a bike, yes. Carry Not over a horse. And just whack him and go <laughs> that, that's a good question because a hiker does not have the right way over a horse. Because, because horses have to be kept under control. If someone, if, if you're on a hike, a trail where they have horseback riding, like down here, and, and a horse is coming, please step off the trail. Mm -hmm. If it's if it's a trail like this, the downhill side and the uphill side, step on the downhill side so that you don't appear. Larger than the horse, that might frighten you. Do not say anything unless the rider says something to you. Uh, it, just kind of sit there and be still as you can. Because some of those horses are great and some of them are unpredictable. Uh, now, mountain bikes and ATVs should give you the right of way. <laughs> but they don't always understand that, kind of like the people with their pets. <laughs> Good question. So, we're going to go, but we're not going to go on to that. Because, but what we would do is we would pick the winners. Well, maybe we can. Let's see. It was it was human waste pile. No, it was cultural artifacts. It was after food scraps, and it was it was it was actually cigarette butts. So cigarette butts, human or. Uh, it depends if the cigarette butt was burning or not. <laughs> no, I don't think that ever decomposes. Well, it, eventually, but we'll get no, to that. Half burn food scraps, cigarette butts, or 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 uh, cultural artifacts, which is worse. Cultural artifacts. Cultural artifacts. Yeah. artifacts usually yeah. wins. Yes. Yeah. Because, because you know, those are gone forever. Okay. So we already talked about the rule of thumbs. Everybody remember it? Yes. Okay. So here we go. Trash timeline. Cigarette buds. How long do you think it takes for them to decompose? Or more. They never actually decompose, they just break down into microplastics. Yeah, when I was in the military, they taught us, they, they taught us field stripping. You had, you had to take all the tobacco out, you had to take all the paper off, and then take the filter and shred it before you could get rid of it. So, one to five years. One to five years. This is science based. I didn't write this. Not five. Uh, it's probably closer to five. But you know, it depends. It depends. I mean, some if you got a filterless cigarette. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's the filter that's the issue. Yeah. A tin can. Fifty years. One hundred fifty. Fifty years. They'll rust eventually. We did say stainless steel. Uh, a nylon fabric. Thirty to forty. Really? Yeah. Nylon. It's nylon. Yes. It will. <laughs> it will decompose. No. But it takes a long time. So if you if you get somehow get poop on your jacket, don't leave it in the woods. <laughs> I saw Scout do that. He buried a t-shirt once. Why did you do, why did you do that? Glass bottles. Uh, a hundred. It's a million. Forever. Forever. Million years. Who knows? They don't know. Plastic six pack holders. 
First of all, if don't ever throw them away, but if you got to cut them. Hundred years. So durable surface challenge. We talked about that. So we're going to see, see, see some pictures and we're going to ask durable surface, yes or no? Grassy field. No. no. Depends. Maybe. <laughs> Snow. Yes. 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 A wildflower meadow. No. no. Cryptobiotic soil crust. No. Gravel. Yes. yes. Moss. No. no. Sand. Yes. yes. Water. Yes. 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 Good job. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, sir. Great information. I uh, really appreciate it. But the question I have is the message has to get to a group of people that either don't care or just are uneducated. I just I don't see how that happens. One person at a time. Yeah. Sometimes it'll take, sometimes, sometimes it won't. It, 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 if, if I don't know if you've noticed, but when you see advertisements for outdoor areas and, and, and some of the people selling outdoor equipment, they're starting to throw leave no trace into those advertisements. People are, people will that eventually will start to sink in. What does that mean? And then they're going to look. And, it, you know, it, 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 it's, it's not going to happen overnight. I mean, this thing has only been around as a formalized thing since 1994. So yeah, yeah. I thought so. Like, yeah, like reaching you. Do you do you guys in schools? Do you do like schools where you educate like a larger group? If I'm invited, I can. Uh, but I don't go. You know, school, school principals are kind of touchy about what they let be in there, uh, especially with with the climate that we have in education today. About you know what books they can read and what courses they can study and things like that. Okay. So, but if, you know. The Klein ISD thing, I did. I participated in that, and they let those students out all day long to go through that, or at least it was I have that. That's what I think it's important to to try to, or maybe you can accomplish more by reaching the younger people. Because when you're doing kids and younger people, they're easier to influence, influence to do the right thing, whereas the older people are already kind of like setting their ways and they're going to do whatever they want to do. You're they, absolutely are, right. And yeah, that's why, shaming their parents. And that's yeah. why <laughs> the, one of the two, two my, uh, primary focuses of LMT Center is, is leave no trace for every kid. They understand this. They get this better than we do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, they read this thing one time. And then you walked up to them and you asked them, what do you do if you need to go to the bathroom? Well, we find a bathroom. What do you do if you can't? Well, there's something else out. What do you do with your trash? You throw it in a trash can. And usually when you're with a younger kid, they're going to be in a place that has a bathroom, has a trash can. They're not going to likely be in the wilderness unless they're with a bill, of course. I hope not. But uh, uh, they, they understand it. And they, they, they even beyond that, they accept it quicker, like you said. And, you know, when, when I... First started trying to teach Leave No Trace to, to scouts several years ago. Some of these older scout maps, I don't want this stuff around there. You're going to tell me I can't have a campfire. No, I'm not. I want to tell you there's better ways to do it. And, and I want to tell you so that you understand what you're doing when you build that giant fire. Then if you decide to, you don't care, that's up to you. But I, my job is to tell you what you should do. Uh, and not, not as a rule, but as, a, as an idea, as a thought. Yes. yes. So, no better, if you better. spend time in the outdoors, wouldn't it be a good idea to do that, think ahead and plan, and model the behavior when you're in a public place? And that applies not just to when you're out there camping out or on a nature trail, but anything you do anywhere in public places as a master naturalist. You know, this isn't about learning something to do. This is about understanding who you want to be. That's what this is about. And when you believe what you've learned is worth modeling for others, won't you make more of an impact than if you try to get in somebody's face and tell them? I mean, really. You're absolutely right. And it does, it goes even beyond leave no trace. If anything you do, if you're doing it the right way, people are watching you. Kids especially are watching you, but other people are watching. Guys, 
when you go to the bathroom. There's people I know that wash their hands because someone else did before they did. And if that first person hadn't been in there, they probably wouldn't have done it. So modeling beat me. I don't know about ladies. But I, know about ladies. But I guarantee, you know, that's just an example. Whatever you do, people are watching and they're going to pick up on things, especially if they're, if you're doing stuff right. And there are more and more studies on all aspects of life to prove that point. I mean, I think about littering. Uh, there's papers written about um, they set it up so that as people came out of a building at the end of the workday, um, they had gone ahead and put flyers under window shield, under, you know, wind, windshield wipers. And so they set it up so that as people started coming out of the building, someone would walk ahead of them to the parking lot, take the flyer out and drop it on the ground and get their car intentionally. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, when all the cars were gone, the parking lot was littered. Well, they did the same thing in a different place, set it up just the same, only they left a flyer on the ground and the first person who was the setup walked out ahead, picked it up and walked it over and put it in a trash can. At the end of that day, there were almost no flyers left in the parking lot. So people are willing to do the right thing if you prompt them but if you don't, here's what can happen. I took a course in the Scouts called Wood Badge. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's like a super, super leadership program that's designed around being in outdoors. As a matter of fact, the corporations sometimes send people to that that aren't even associated with Scouts. But after it's a couple of weekends, after the first weekend, we handed out a brochure and it was talking about some stuff and, and, and Leave No Trace is one of them. And we left and go home for the weekend. And the camp ranger told me, he was a friend of mine. He said, you know what's funny? He said, uh, there were brochures all over the field. And I picked it up. And the first thing on top of it was leave no trace. Uh -huh. Nobody said a word. Nobody modeled it. Everybody was in a hurry to get home. So if you leave them to their own devices and don't try to educate them and don't model it, people are going to revert to <laughs> caveman mentality. <laughs> So anyway, uh, other questions? Great, great questions. I mean, there, there is no real answer on how you can fix it other than just keep trying. Yes. I'm just curious. I noticed um, years ago, I used to always see littering signs when I was driving down the highway and it would say littering fines, you know, $400. Fines. I don't see those very much anymore. Is it just me? No, I don't either. What yeah. you typically see now is and not so much around here, but like in North Texas, where I, I moved here from Dallas about 10 years ago, you would see this road uh, cleaned by such yes. and such a group. You know? <laughs> There's some of that around here, but there was all over it there. Yeah. So, so, so you see that instead. Yeah. I think so it's a way. Of, I think it's a way of making people no. think. No. And see, that's the problem. That's the problem. The state of Texas law. It's a law. If you litter less than five pounds of oh, trash the fine is five hundred dollars and then if you litter more than five pounds of trash it goes up and it goes up and it goes up but if you don't enforce it yeah just kind of like running stop signs yeah i don't even see the signs anymore no yeah. like when i was growing up no. everywhere it implies that oh, some cop is going to stop you and give you that ticket any law enforcement officer any Law enforcement officer can give cite you for littering. Do they do it? No. no. Well, that, so that you know that's not our fault. That's that's on them. But they're more interested in the bigger fines. Well, it's hard to if, if they did, if they did, it would be an add-on thing. We don't have enough police officers to pull people over well, yeah. for littering. I mean, we can't afford that. You want what? You don't want to pay the taxes to do that. Just if you go through a red light now. I mean, you see the red light now. What, what do you do? I sit there and wait to make sure people oh, yeah. are stopping. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because, yeah. because there's nobody there to enforce. And we had red light cameras that would help do that. We took them away, at least in, in, in Conroe we did. And, and I don't know that they helped, but I know since they're gone, there's now that sometimes you'll see three or four cars run through a red light <laughs> instead of just one. But so I've seen people we don't have a police in to front do of that. a cop and still want to get stopped. There, I mean, I, I'm an HR director for a city of Conroe. We don't have enough police officers to do that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so I have two things. One, in regards to the littering, um, 
So years ago, a long time ago, before my husband and I were into this, um, he did throw a cigarette butt out the window in California, and he was fined seven hundred dollars. Yeah. So in some states, they do enforce if, it. They if, just don't hear it. Well, if 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 you're in a state that's subject to wildfire and they can't throw oh, yeah. a cigarette butt out, that's a whole different ballgame. Oh yeah. yeah. So he was in lots of trouble. <laughs> um, but my second is. You said you wait to be invited to a school. Yes. Do you ever go out and say, hey, we offer this if you're interested? When I have time. Okay. I have a full-time job. I'm the, I do this. I do the Texas Master Naturals. I, do, <laughs> I run about 40 Facebook groups. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> one, cool. one of them has 60,000 members. Uh, so, 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 but yeah, sometimes I send that out there. Okay. And that's part of my job as state advocate is to make people aware of that. But all these trainers and stuff under me, they can do that too. Well, that's what I was going to say. Do the trainers do that? Do they reach out? Some of them do. Some of them just get it to get a certificate and hang on the wall. We have to be honest. Uh -huh. There'll be some, maybe not in this room, but there'll be Texas Master Naturalists that get, get that certificate and hang on the wall. They'll never do another thing in their life after they got through this course. They may get certified the first time and then they'll never hear from them again. And we've got some. We've got probably 100. 40 active members, but there's like three or 400 that have been through and have at one time been a member. Just guess on the number of actors. I'm probably pretty close. Okay. So, anything else? So I think right now we're going to take a, I don't know how long of a break while we get set up for the next class. Terry, or uh, Carolyn, I don't know what you want me to do here. Because we got all these Zoom people here. Uh, thank you. For We are going to go get treasure and pay all these bills. Yeah. <laughs> I like to wrap up the bills. I'm just too busy. If you have any leftover, you know, bills? Just keep writing checks. Bills are not I'm going to check. Can you do it? I don't see any more questions. Yeah, Terry. If you want to work, I'm going to rob her. Yeah. 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 Would you mind if I took two of the no, yellow sorry. ones? I have two pickles. I want to have a Thank you. Yeah. I love this. Right. I love it. Right. It's in school since those kids have been making tablets and so they grow up learning that. Right. I love it. Right. I love it. Right. Love it. Five or six of these? Sure. Which one do you have? We get one left back back to Huntsville State Park. Who works for the world? We can and what that we is have or no, this is attached oh, to these are children. This is much yeah. more. Well, th this is kids. This is front country. So take this is one. This is front country, like a state park, like car camping. Mm -hmm. And these are for kids. So take both. Yeah. I think we can take these off their backpacks and put these on. Okay. And actually, I find this more expressive than one for adults. Yeah, really, it is. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. Oh, you uh, hand them out and get back. Uh, we attach them to the backpack. Yeah. They use for the weekend. Okay. So they don't keep them. No, they don't keep them. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. And the Girl Scouts are here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I don't need any more liver at home. I'm over here. Thank you much. Yes, sir. So, yeah. So, you know, if you can go to the website and search for pills and pills. Weekly, I use and you can report to TPWD, but it's always beneficial or I have birds in there, and they will actually send someone out to test the water and find out what it is. Now, if it's just in a tiny little pond within a neighborhood, they might not come out. But nonetheless, the problem is the combination of and whatever got water in there when it finds a difference. 
She does sometimes, but when she carries too much, like especially if she's got her bladder, yeah, she's like, Oh, this is heavy. Oh, uh -huh. and I'm like, Okay, fine. so I end up carrying like everybody's water and everybody's food, yeah, yeah. and the heart. Oh, you does it work? Yeah, because I was like, Yeah. And I had to pick it up a couple of times because most of them, the writing was just safe, but a couple of them was like this. Yeah, and I'm sorry. I'm getting old. Well, don't talk to me about getting old, baby. Now realize in five months, I'll be saying that. You're with me, but I'll be fine. 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 I'll be I, I think you might need your glasses <laughs> checked back. <laughs> well, that's part of it. <laughs> I, have, I do have macular degeneration. <laughs> do you? Uh, they, they, they looked at my eyes and said, I had no sign of macular have, degeneration or whatever it is. I, what I had was, a, you know, a small amount of pressure. Is a precursor to and so when they did my cataracts, they put it in my eyes. I don't have any shots to make a regeneration. I don't have any kinds of big shots. I have a kind of They make me take carriage too twice a day. Virus. But eventually, eventually it will turn with you know, I get shots. But you know, one eye, I can't, it's got scarring. Uh, so I can, I have peripheral vision, but I can't read with it. Wow. So, yeah, the know. joys of getting old. Yep. I got a new hip. <laughs> I got a new hip. Yeah, I got mine in yeah. June. I'm, um, I'm two years. Let me think. And I love it. Yeah. I'm two years into a new hip, yeah. I'm three months in well, well, yeah. Yep, I got it in June. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm loving it. Yeah. I'm the loving only it. problem I had with the, getting the new hip was the, um, the during the surgery itself, you know, you're anesthetized. Uh, wiped out my short term. I mean, I mean, absolutely wiped out. I had a I had a lot. And I've heard all these bad things about it. So it, it was a and for, and I also have lower back pain. For a month, I didn't have any lower back pain, wow. but it's back. But, but uh, it sometimes hurt when it's, I have a small car, it sits like this, and sometimes I hurt right in here. And it's not pain, it's just yeah. you notice. Know, yeah. yeah. But walking, oh, yeah. it's like yeah. walking. Yeah. And which is great. Yeah. Yeah. I've got so I just barely walk. I, I was using so pain to walk. I wasn't that too. I, I, asked, him, I asked him about doing the other one. Okay. Mine's, okay. Mine's, I, mine's in the hospital. Mine's hard to apply. And I have no cartilage left on this one and growing bones. I've got a little bit left on this one. He says, when can you do that? I said, well, wait, wait a year. Wait when it starts hurting. But he said, but don't wait six months after this. I can get on the first one. Right. I'll get it eventually. I waited about a year. Yeah. So, yeah, but I love, I'm, I'm, I'm so, I'm so much, walking is so much easier now. All right. Oh my God. 
Okay. Don't, don't let me go over, and I really like okay, how, how long do you want to do the talk part? Yes. Yeah, 45 like, minutes max. Okay. Maybe, I don't know, maybe. So it's 10 15. So, so, so it's, it's 10 15. So, what I'd like is for us to have time to go outside yeah. to talk about uh, field notes versus journaling, look for some mushrooms, yeah. uh, talk about what we might journal about, that kind of stuff. Can I make okay. a couple of announcements? Oh, certainly. Okay. Are you ready, guys? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Andrea. Yeah. That would be fun. I was looking. I'm like, where's Diana? Where is she? Okay. So I wanted to remind you all that we do have some outreach opportunities on our calendar coming up. We do have the Woodlands Landscaping Solutions. That's going to take place on September 24th. Yep, nine it's, to noon. It's going to be Rob, Rec. Rob Fleming Park, Rob Fleming Rec Center. Mm -hmm. What day? Not on September Saturday. 24th. Saturday, September 24th. Now, what what I'd like for you to do if you're interested in doing that, there is a link in our last bulletin. Everyone's getting the bulletin. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Have you read it? Okay. Good. There's a link in there. You can go on and you can sign up to actually participate. What that does is it tells me that I need to get in touch with you and give you all of the great stuff we have to participate. There's a room right behind this room that y'all can go in and visit. We have a rolling cart that has our tablecloth that says Texas National Naturalist instead of Texas. We have our own tablecloth. <laughs> we, have, we have file cabinets that have information on anything you can imagine, whether it's birding or native plants or whatever you think you'd like to share at with the Woodlands Landscaping Solutions. Native plants is always great. Um, gardening for hummingbirds is great. Um, anything like that. But then you also share information about what it is to be a master naturalist. I know you all think, oh, I don't know enough what to start. <laughs> Trust me, it's more than most people know. Most people don't even know what a master naturalist is, right? And that'll be one of the first questions people ask you if they walk up to the booth is, what do y'all do? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And why are you here? And you can say that you like it. <laughs> it's, it's a great way, you know, people come up there, they're always, at Woodland Lands, Woodlands Landscaping Solution, they're always so excited about whatever information you have to give to them and share with them. They're, um, they're more likely to, to ask you, you know, what do you do as an astronaturalist? And you can say, well, whatever you want to do, whether it's mycology or wetlands or forest or whatever, you know, so you just find that, that thing that pulls them in and makes, lets them know that there's a place for them with us. Um, let's see, that's I think. So sign up for that. There are a few others. There's one up in Walker County. The Master Gardeners are having one of their big yes. plant sales, right? Yes. And yes. so we need we people for that. To invite us or you guys to come and have a booth there. Yes. And we, we will, but we need people to sign up. When is that date? That is on October the, uh, yeah. October 7th, Saturday. So if it's on Saturday, it's the 8th. Is that 8th? Okay. I'm not sure. It's in the bulletin. I put all of these in the bulletin under outreach opportunities, okay? And they all have links because I need to know if people are able to go. If people aren't able to go, then we just don't show up, okay? Um, which is, it's a lost opportunity for us. And it really doesn't take a whole lot of energy to, 
to do, and you also need some awesome people. So are you saying that if, if we were if we were gonna go to the to the women's landscaping solutions thing, we can talk about whatever our bag is and you have stuff we can pin down? Okay, that's fine. Make it easy for us. I'm, I'm, it's so easy. It's so I easy. did it one time early on in my internship. Yeah. Uh, it was that Wildlife Center. Friends of Texas Wildlife. Yes. And I went there and, you know, I was with a couple other natural naturalists. But I just talked about why I joined. And, you know, you tell your own story uh -huh. and, you know, you go from there and they were like, Wow, you know, uh -huh. no idea. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> okay, and just just a little follow up. Yeah. Another class is starting. Another what? month. Okay, okay, so our um, registration is going to start in October, mm -hmm. and the next classes are going to start in January. We're hoping that they end by this is by April. We're going to run it a little tighter next year. Yeah, so we're going to end by the very beginning of June. Beginning of June. Very beginning. We're starting in February. In February. No, February. January. 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 At the beginning of June. Um, yeah. I had several people that did not sign up this year because they said, yeah, you're taking up every other Saturday for the summer. In my summer. Yeah, yeah. and I mean, <coughs> even into September. Sign up starts in October. And so yes. I said, okay. And uh, so that's. Oh, so this is great that we're starting to. to to get these outreach opportunities. You know, summer is usually kind of a dead season for us because it's so big to shut off. But a lot of these places are starting to have these opportunities for us to go and man booths, whether it's pollinator, um, things that are going on. Um, like today is the Hummingbird Festival at Club Woods. That's going to still be going on in Asia today if y'all want to run up to Club Woods. I understand that there's a ton of hummingbirds. And they banned them. They catch them and yeah. they banned them. Ooh. How awesome is that? Yeah. Right? What is your question? Mary? Um, so I signed up to go work with Tristan. Awesome. Uh, aging and documenting um, and checking the deer at the check stations. Awesome. In the National Forest. So um, I was wondering, is there something in here that you have? That I could set up on my table while I'm helping him do that. That would be something about, um, you know, kind of like the leave no trace because you know all these hunters are going in and maybe they oh, have man. stuff and and just I wish to, you had thought of that because you could have gotten a bunch of those things from Andre taking them out. A bunch of those little plastic pieces. Yes, yes. you could put out a bunch of these in Andre and then. Because what. that is something that um, I mean, my even my own family is a bunch of hunters, but we notice in the forest, you know, they go out there and they're sitting there hunting, and they might leave their water bottle or their plastic bottle or their snack. So I was thinking when I signed up, I was like, what is it that I could like that tell these hunters when they hunters, come to right? check their deer in? Yeah. And I thought, well, the, yes. the first thing that came to mind was litter. So why don't we? Um, Get with me after. I'll make sure you have all Andre's contact info and he'll be able to give you some of those that you can share with them. I don't think I have a lot of video trace because it, he's yeah, not or okay, it's good. Yeah, I think that's perfect for you to share with them. Especially if they're standing there waiting. If you have something yeah. for people to read yeah. and they're not on their phone, they'll step up and they'll yeah. be able to ask you questions. Okay, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is judging. Judge yes. <laughs> Stand up, Judge <laughs> If y'all don't know, Judge leads walks the first Saturday of every month and every Monday around the Creekside Parks <coughs> that are off of the Ann Snyder Way in Creekside. You know where that is? I see, I see faces like mm -hmm. where is that? Okay, Ann Snyder Way has a bunch of ponds. It's better drive. And yeah. they're Dr. Ann Schneider Doctor. Drive. Dr. Dr. <laughs> Dr. 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 Drive. And you can you can put that into Dr. Ann Snyder Drive into your Google and it'll take you right there. If dead ends at the parking lot for the park, she will take you, lead you on walks, identify birds, take counts of birds. It's a great place to go because birds are migrating at this time of year and you can see amazing things. Yes. One of the things coming up is. Oh, voting. Oh, yeah. Tell me about voting. Yes, tell me about the judges. 
Well, okay, so there's a grant at state, and it's seventy five thousand dollars, I think. Yes. yes. To um, go to any park in the area, and we are up for a grant, and we want to build a bird farm in this place. We have a great place for it. <laughs> yeah. So, but you have to go online to vote. Um, there's a link, and it's on. It's on you right. you sent it out. Yes, it's yeah. in the book. So, park your park. Awesome. If you just Google park. Your park, yes, P -E -R park, and then look for the George Mitchell Preserve yes. uh, listing, and you can vote. You put in yes, your yes. email. Please actually put in a real email. They never contact you, but it's strictly for voting purposes and to make sure you're not voting more than once per day, but it ends on the 12th. Yes. So um, the township, for the uh, Bird Blind and Outdoor Nature Center at Ann Snyder Way was in first place, but we've dropped into second. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it'd be great if you if you vote every single day from now to the 12th, yes. vote every single day. And if, uh, you know, if you have a work email and a personal email, there's no rule that you can't vote from each one. I hadn't thought of that. I mean, you, you, um, yeah. If your kids have email addresses and they aren't going to vote, I mean, you know, I'm just not either. Know. <laughs> and you do not have to live in the woodlands to vote for the George Mitchell Preserve. <laughs> anybody can vote anywhere from anywhere so uh you know reach out to your circle of influence and ask everybody to vote so go online find that link and send it to everybody the woodland I township know. has one that they post almost like it yeah. shows up every day and advertise you probably can find the link on the woodlands township somewhere just yeah. okay so does anybody have any questions they need to, to shout out while we're talking about the program is stuff? perk your park by the way yeah. by niagara water and they'll get the at hours for going to the bird and That's if you need them soon they'll come on monday <laughs> if you can come on monday yes or can you get one of your hours you can get out of their advanced training and she's she's helping you learn which birds how to do the birds and stuff okay so what time Seven thirty. Yeah. Yeah. You can leave early if you have to. You, you don't have to spend the whole day. earlier in the morning. You get to see more birds. Yes, yeah. because birds get really, really. I mean, you've heard of Dawn Forest. That's right. That's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And anybody that would help with the Walker County National Garden or plant sale on the eighth of October, uh, let me have your name before we do it at the next break. Okay, that sounds good. This is the ad, guys. Okay, show me that. He lives in Huntsville. Okay. So, and what? His wife, his wife Sharon, is up here with us today, but she's on the planning board in Huntsville. Planning Commission. Important part. Now she's learning all the good stuff. <laughs> the trees, right? <laughs> and so, you know, one of the things that Andre talked about was. Um, a program that he said we've never gotten involved in as a chapter but also don't forget uh, those of you who are texas water specialists or interested in that certification or just water nerds like me um don't forget part of the programming okay so for those of you who don't know me i have other uh shirts with name tags i wear that say woodlands township and I'm the water conservation specialist for the township. So all, all of the activities that we do uh, volunteer-wise for water stop uh, periodically and frequently include waterway litter cleanups, but we've taken it a step further into real citizen science in that we, we go out and pick up the trash but then we bring it back together. So we're all there to work on it. We dump it out on a big tarp and we sort that, sh that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and do a tally that's part of Keep Texas Beautiful's Trash Free Waters program. It's an EPA grant funded program. And what they're doing is building a database of what kind of trash appears where. 
So Township participated uh, and, and Woodlands Green participated last year in the pilot to set it up and try it out to build this database, this trashy database. Mm -hmm. um, and it's citizen science because there is a potential once you see, hey, in this location, we found a ton of that. But in another location, we found a ton of this. Then you have the opportunity to say, okay, why is this here? You, you can look around. So in the pilot last year, what we discovered was we were working in a, a long transect behind a shopping center. And all of a sudden we come to a spot where, I mean, all the trash was either like juice containers or <laughs> toy pieces from some tchotchke that you buy kids and they eat something and put the, the, the we found out on the you walk around to the front side of that strip of the mall it's a daycare center yeah okay so now what you can do is you can go to the daycare people and you can say hey is there a way we could help you to eliminate some of this trash because next time it rains this trash washes into that storm drain inlet, and now we've just polluted our local waterway. We could get off on water for an hour here, so let's get back off that. But if you want to do some citizen science trash stuff, get in contact with me. You'll surely know how to reach me, but this will be my personal email. I'll show you at the end of this, but um, you can find me in a number of different ways, or Carolyn can send you my work email address, but we do this Keep Texas Beautiful Trash Free Waters program for a lot of stuff that, that we include auditing the trash. So let me know if you're interested in that. Jeff? So if, we, if we happen to pick up a little bit of trash, do you want us to bring it to you or do you want us to categorize and send you the results? So um, there is an actual form. There is a data form so that you break down into categories. I mean, you know, the nature of collecting data is you have to know what you're collecting in some way to categorize. Once you've categorized, then you can count. So either I could send you the form or, you know, way back, Almost two months ago, we did a trash pickup. We picked up like seven bags of trash from this one waterway. Mm. We randomly picked three of the seven bags. We dumped them out. We audited it. I put the rest of it into a big trash bag, tied it up. And then the next time I wanted to demo how to do this program, we took another couple of those bags out of there. So. Yeah, I usually have a bag of trash I'm keeping. So. <laughs> so if you want to pick up trash and don't want to do the audit yourself, do you can bring it to me. I'll put it in my big bag of trash. And then the next time we meet at a park, like September 17, from 9 to 11, right. 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 Shadow Pen Park. <laughs> Graduation. <laughs> we're busy. <laughs> but that's the next one we're doing, a waterway cleanup, and we'll be doing a trash audit there. So we, I set those periodically, and you could bring your trash, save it in a, you know, a nice tied up bag, bring your trash, and we'll audit it. Is this the same thing that trash they were the funding agency. They helped create the funding for it. So yes, it's all the same. It's all the same litter database. Yeah, they, it's a it's a Keep Texas Beautiful program that Mark participates in. Yeah. So do you want to talk about mushrooms now? Yes. yes. So um, about three years ago, I made a presentation for the township on fungi, and. You know, they said, what do you want to call this? And I said, well, I don't know. Fungi are kind of weird. And and so they said, well, how about the weird world of fungi? I said, but, but wait, fungi are also wonderful. <laughs> so this title originated from that presentation. But I love this title because there are weird things about fungi, but there are also wonderful things about it. So, yeah, it is a strange world to deal with. So. We can't talk about fungi 
unless we talk about ecosystems. It's interactions. That's what drives ecosystem functions is all the interactions that are going on between biotic organisms, between biotic organisms and abiotic elements. I mean, interactions create the functions that provide us services. So what kind of services do we get from ecosystems? Basically four kinds, four broad categories. What are they? Food. So provisioning, and it goes beyond food. It could be medicines or uh, all kinds of stuff. So provisioning. Shelter, is that provisioning? Um, I don't know, we could call that supporting, but supporting is much broader than that. Recycling. So cultural, recreation would come under cultural. Now what? Recycling. So now you're talking about regulating. So provisioning is what we get that we need, but supporting is what we get so we can live. Oxygen, water, those kinds of things. Um, um, what did I, what was the other one? Recreation. Recreation. Cultural. Cultural. Cultural, but um, regulating, regulating. So give me another example of regulating services. Providing it. Speak up. So decomposing would be more supporting. How about temperature? So temperature regulation. How about absorbing uh, excess? rainfall so we don't flood how about <laughs> flooding control how about pollution dilution mm -hmm. yeah. so things that regulate so interactions can be really really complex but all those interactions together are what create the functions that give us our services so I've asked us to consider three things here. So what do trees and plants do all day? They do. So they provide a lot of the, in all those four categories, don't they? And one of them, somebody said oxygen. So how does that work? How does oxygen work? Give off Is that, are we talking about interactions? Yes. Are we talking about interactions between something living and something non-living? Yeah. Yes. So those interactions are create the function that we get oxygen in the air from. They also create all their own food. They're, they're the primary producer. So how does that work? Uh, yeah, but and then they they take the energy from the sun. They create their their stuff, and then they end up giving it to everybody else. So they're the primary producer. Everybody else is secondary or tertiary. So brings us to consideration number two: things that take in food give off waste. Okay, how do trees give off waste? Oxygen. Above ground. We get oxygen, but what happens below ground? The antimicrobial fungi. <laughs> okay, y'all are saying so they just get off nutrient, like nutrients into the soil from their waste. Everything that takes in food has to give off waste. For trees, the main trees, plants, the main thing they have in abundance are those carbs, those sugar starches that they make through photosynthesis. So that would be the most likely thing they have in excess to give off as waste. So through the root system, the word is exudates, E-X-U-D-A-T-E. -E. Uh, those are those carbs. Those are primarily those carbs. Yes, there might be some other things they, nutrients included, but it's mostly carbon-based stuff that they 
exude through the root system into the soil. We, we know how we give off waste. We know how most animals give off waste, but that's how plants and trees give off waste. So now we're starting to see there are soil interactions that can happen. So the thing to consider next is all these microbial soil communities, what their roles are, macro, micro invertebrates, you know, Who's doing what down there in the soil? Which sort of takes us where we're headed here. Somebody made the comment about mycorrhizal fungi. People who do this stuff kind of categorize fungi into seven big groups. The real two that we really want to talk about right now are endomycorrhizal fungi, which as the name implies, they invade into the plant's roots, even to the cellular level. And ectomycorrhizal fungi, once again, as the name suggests, they may, there may be some slight penetration into the roots, but mostly they create networks around the roots because Guess what my guy's favorite food is? Exudation. <laughs> <laughs> that way. Starch. All those carbon-based things that trees exude is what they want. That's their food. So it's to their advantage to be first on the scene, right? They're wrapped around the roots or even growing into the roots. So within those mycorrhizal fungi, I should advance a slide here. Um, there are really complex interactions going on between plants, fungi, bacteria, soil organisms like uh, springtails and nematodes. I mean, once again, it's all about how things interact that make the system work. E I'm sure you figured out by now, you can't talk about one thing in nature without talking about everything it interacts with. And that's what is the amazing part about fungi is everything directly or indirectly interacts with fungi. Life on earth could not exist without fungi, period, full stop. So fungi are the reason there are terrestrial plants. When those first few algae washed up on a shore somewhere back in eons ago, and there were microscopic fungi in the soil that were able to connect with, with that algae and exchange nutrients, the algae is photosynthesizing, so it's producing those sugars, and the fungi are able to make uh, nutrients that are in the soil more bioavailable for the root system to take up. It was that connection that allowed the first plants to move on to terrestrial life, soils instead of water. Without fungi, well, let me break down and ask the question. So here's a question. Well, when were the first algae found on the ground? Do they know what those fungi were living on? What they ate? So we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Okay. But, but okay. essentially, fungi can decompose anything, everything. They could break down minerals if there were any soil organisms, micro, macro soil organisms. We'll talk about it more, but I, I don't mind jumping ahead. So how do fungi eat? The, if you want to <laughs> compare it to a plant, the fungus entire's name is called a mycelium. And as it grows, those 
tiny, tiny microscopic hair-like things that grow out of it that you might liken to roots on a plant grow out. Those are called hyphae. Everything happens at the tip of the hip, each hyphae as it's growing out. All, everything it needs gets pushed out to those tips, just like with plants. We'll get to there. We'll come circle back around and get there in a minute. But everything gets pushed out to the tips of that hyphae as it's, hyphae as it's growing through the soil. And so, um, you know, one of the things I've, I've got up here is how adaptable they are. Fungi have this wealth of enzymes. That's who they are. That's what they are. That's how they are. They have this wealth of enzymes. So this hypha is growing through the soil. It encounters some mineral. It retools its enzymes to break down that mineral. It, it growing through the soil. It encounters a springtail. It some fungi actually put out hormones, pheromones, some kind of signaling in the soil to springtails and other organisms, other animals that live in the soil that say, hey, come over here and have lunch. And the springtail works its way through, takes a bite of the fungi and dies. <laughs> yes, there are predatory fungi. And now the at the tip of this hypha, it retools its enzymes. It literally liquefies the body of that springtail. And then through the outer cuticle of the fungi, it absorbs the nutrients and then decomposes the, the carcass. And those nutrients are not necessarily what the fungus really wants, but guess what? It knows that in another part of that mycelium, there's hyphae growing into or around the root of a tree. Let's shuttle these nutrients over to the tree. Hey tree, I've got some nitrogen. You want it? The tree says, yeah, man, send it on up. And hey, I've got some extra sugar. You want it? Yeah, let's make an exchange here. Interactions, it's about interactions. So what can fungi really do? I, we've, we've skipped ahead. Um, yeah, so most of that we've covered. I wanted to show you if you could look in the soil and see what a hyphal network looked like. I was lucky enough one day, we were out on a mushroom hunt and someone said, hey, Terry, what is this? Picked up this little clump of leaves. They were really buried down, covered over by some other leaf litter. Picks it up and this massive spider webby looking things was holding this mass of leaves together. And this leaf was right on top. I said, we got to take a picture of this right now because if you could see into the soil, this is more or less what you'd see that network that fungi form. And this may be more than one kind of fungus. This may be several different fungi that are all interacting with each other. So fungi not only make those networks in the soil that are moving water around, they're moving nutrients around, they are picking up after soil organisms that have consumed some dead matter and pooped out their waste. Well, if that waste has some carbon in it, let's go break that down. If the body is still available, that dead body is still available of an insect, let's break that down and take the nitrogen and other things from it. So it's all about interaction. It's all about the complex way things work together. And fungi are really the network that glues it all into a workable plan. So let's think about the roots of a plant. As with fungi, 
all the action is at the very tip of roots of plants. That's where everything gets shuttled because that's what has to have enough turgor. It has to have enough moisture to give it strength to push through the soil. But it's also where it's seeking uh, uh, nutrients to, to absorb. It's also where the exudates are released through the tip of that soil. So the tips of roots, as with the tips of, of fungal hyphae, all the action is. But because of that, I mean, that's where Mr. Nematode, that's a plant eating nematode, wants to go because it's, uh, you know, soft and fresh and has all this good stuff that you can grab by eating it. I mean, I don't know how much you've looked at nematodes, but there's a, a zillion different kinds and, it, and they're categorized by what their little tooth like thing is that they use to pierce a tree's roots or a plant's roots. There's, you know, all shredding and sucking and all those things. So the nematode comes along, he takes a little pinch of this nice juicy root tip. The plant begins to release its own enzymes into the soil that says, Hey, uh, springtails and nematodes, uh, smell this. This is a, a, a guide to you. You should come here because maybe there's some fresh new little roots here. Come over here and attract those soil organisms to a false place until this root tip can get past where they were trying to eat it and strengthen enough that now there's a new tip that's moved further down in the soil. The fungi are looking for those same roots so they can grow into it. Now, the ones that actually penetrate into roots to the cellular level, they're called arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi because they actually create little knots tiny little knots within the root system called arbuscules, that's where the exchange happens, not on the outer side for the ectomycorrhizal fungi, but on the inside within the root. So they're exchanging nutrients and carbon inside the root system. So what happens there is now this fungus Realizing the plant has problems, it goes to work. And it, so it begins uh, other parts of the fungus that are outside the root that are part of a larger network attract more moisture in some cases. There are fungi that grow their hyphae more or less in loops. And so as the nematode is swimming through the soil and hits one of those loops, the fungus sends all of its moisture there, puffs it up, strangles the nematode. And then guess what? It puts out enzymes, it liquefies the body, and then it absorbs all the nutrient. Hey tree, I've got some more nitrogen, you want it? The tree says, yeah, man, and I got some more sugar. So let's make an exchange. It's all about the interactions. They are so complex. The plant may also, just FYI, be putting out additional enzymes into the soil. Nematode bites it here. Plant puts out other enzymes into the soil up here that attract the kind of soil insect that eats nematodes. Mm -hmm. So now there's dead nematodes here because these other things came and you know munched on them, but there's bits and pieces. Here come the decomposing, the saprophytic fungi. Um, most of those are the ectomycorrhizal fungi. Here they come and they decompose these parts, but they do it the same way the others do. They liquefy it, they absorb what minerals or nutrients there are from the body of these dead bits of pieces from other predatory soil organisms. 
So, so it's it's not one thing. It's not one thing that fungi do. It's not one way they help. But if you could see those networks, they would look something like this. Um, I'm not gonna, I could have shown you a hundred photos today. I'm only gonna show you a couple of them. These are Ammonita muscaria. They're a great decomposing fungus. We find these all the time in our forests, our local forests. So um, there are those who say it's edible. There are ammonitas that kill you if you eat them, period. Um, there are ammonitas that would only make you so ill you wish you would die. Uh, and then there are these only couple of them that are considered edible, but the variety of ammonitas is so great. And there are so many that sort of kind of look like others. Um, I avoid them completely for the table. Let them do their job. However, if you happen to have property or maintain your yard in a way that isn't full of turf grass and that you put chemicals on and you end up with some odd fungi in your yard, if you have kids, grandkids, pets that tend to pick stuff up and put it in their mouth, maybe what you want to do is like you do for the dog poop, put your hand in a bag, pick it up, tie it up, throw it away. This is just the fruiting body of the mushroom. The fungal growth underneath is the, if you want to compare it to the plant or the tree, this is like an apple on a tree. This is just a fruit. So you can pick this, you're not killing the, you're not killing the fungus that's beneficial in the soil. So if you need to remove them, remove them. But this is a great hardworking decomposer. Now this one has a couple of different looking things in it. In the back is what a regular entoloma mushroom looks like, stem and cap. In the front is the same mushroom, but it has been infected with another kind of mushroom called armillaria. Entoloma mushrooms in their normal form are not edible. Supposedly, once they've been infected by our malaria, those are edible. Okay, I'm gonna take your word for that one. <laughs> I'm a very cautious wild mushroom eater. There's only a handful that, in my opinion, are unmistakable that I will eat, but God, I love them. You know, it's like that. So, We've talked about it, there are complex organisms. We've talked about it that they're critical to nutrient recycling. Something we haven't yet gotten to is the differences in these major types of fungi may also be why in some forests, invasives have an easier time getting a toehold. And if you think about this, Most fungi have specific associations with a kind, a species, a family, a genus, but not all. Some are like equal opportunity employers. You know, any plant they connect to, they're willing to exchange nutrients and water for carbs. Those forests, which the, the ones that are more easily, I'm gonna use the word infected by non-native invasive species are pines and oak forests. Mm -hmm. Some of the others that are more beech and elm or whatever, um, it's, a, it's a lot, lot harder because the fungi that associate with those trees are a lot pickier. And for a lot of trees, it's the tree's decision whether to let the fungus invaded. In fact, there's, you know, the thing about technology is we learn something new every day just because we can see it now that we never could see before. We have tools that work for that. And it, it turns out that 
you know, when it comes to associations between fungi and trees, they can be very, very specific. So back to what I was gonna say, for non-natives, that be, especially those that tend to become invasive, this one size fits all mentality on the part of the fungi that, you know, if it grows and can give me carbs, I'll give it nutrients, make it a little bit easier in those forests for invasives to take hold. What does that mean for us? If we're doing our job, we patrol that a little more regularly because where are invasive species going to grow? Where are they gonna grow? Where to get the nutrients in the You can write this down. In any fully functioning ecosystem, all the niches are filled. There's no room for something new to come in. When you disturb the ecosystem and its functions, that's when new things can happen. So this is not a natural forest by any means, but let's do a think thought experiment here. If this was a natural forested area and we decide we really want to be able to guide people to go look at some interesting feature and we cut a pathway for them to walk on, have we disturbed that ecosystem? Mm -hmm. Yes, we have. So what that means is now there's sunlight where there wasn't before, or there's an opening for encroachment by new things. So some of those new things are gonna be natives from the forest, but if it becomes say a path, new pathway that maybe some birds use to move around within that ecosystem, are they likely to drop some seeds in their poop? Are non-natives going to have at least an equal opportunity to get a foothold there, but the nature of invasive species means they have a better advantage than the natives because they don't have natural controls. We don't have the pests or the diseases that affect them like we have for our natives that have these relationships. So invasive species tend to begin where there are disturbances. Well, we humans in our infinite wisdom disturb natural areas every single day. I mean, for every 8% of population growth, there's about a 40% increase in impervious surfaces. Think about that. So, okay, we, we're expecting more people to move here. We got to build more houses. But you don't just build houses. You have to build roads to the houses. And all of the houses have roofs and driveways, impervious surfaces. And those roads have to come from somewhere to connect to somewhere. And people who move into a new subdivision would like to have some nearby shopping so you have to build some place to shop that has roofs and parking lots and streets to get there, more impervious surfaces. And probably if it's a big enough area, they're gonna want schools locally for their kids. So we've gotta build a school, more rooftops, parking lots, roads to get there. And maybe you would like to work near home. So now businesses start to move in build a building, parking lot, rooftop, roads to get there. Every 8% population growth, you can expect about a 40% increase in impervious surfaces. What does that do to ecosystem function? Now we have fragments. Well, one of the things I want you to think about is this. If we're going to replace natural areas with urban areas, maybe we could consider getting out of this mentality from Victorian days that you showed how important you are 
by having vast green lawns that it took a lot of servants to maintain to show how important you were. And instead, we think about creating urban areas that can support our ecosystems. Things that can capture and store carbon, plants that can support insects and pollinators. Maybe we could start thinking about that. You know, I think about that phrase from that old Rolling Stones song that says, he can't be a man because he doesn't smoke the same cigarette as me. Well, think about that. That's one of the ways that we show how darn important we are is that we have to have so much lawn that we have to hire people to take care of it for us. Look how important I am. Okay, maybe rethink that. I don't know if you know this, if you live in the Woodlands Township, there is no requirement to have turf grass, none, zero. In fact, there's a limit on how much turf grass you can have in your front yard. You cannot have more than 60% of your front yard area in turf grass. None is better. So what do you want your landscape to do all day? What kind of landscape do you wanna have? And if you quit growing grass and using chemicals on it to keep it green no matter what, and instead, you, you, you put in native plants. Now what you've done is create an environment where all kinds of other native things have habitat. So I'll give you a couple of quick examples. I'm sure you've heard by now, uh, monarch butterflies are now on the national groups the international groups endangered species list. But think about why that is. So we've lost habitat. We have fragmented areas where they could find, where the adults, the fine butterflies can find uh, pollen and nectar sources. The pressure we've put on the environment has really eliminated a lot of the host plant, the milkweed plant, because it, it likes to grow in kind of wild, woolly places. It likes to grow in fields and meadows. Well, we, we hardly have any fields and meadows now, but we could create that kind of environment in our landscapes and plant more milkweed so that we can not only bring in the adults for the nectar, but we give them a place to lay their eggs. Here's another thing about interactions. You may have already heard me talk about this in other places, but in essence, all plants are toxic to insects, period. It takes not just millennia, but eons for insects and plants to develop the kind of relationships so that they can interact. They're, they can have those symbiotic relationships. So how is it that monarch caterpillars can eat milkweed when that sap stuff, that milky stuff that comes out of a milkweed, it's one of the best glues in the world. No matter what insect tries to eat that, it glues their mouth parts closed and they die from starvation. So how do monarchs get around that? Over the eons, they got smarter. They made adaptations. They learned that when that larva hatches out of the egg, the first thing it does is eat the rest of the eggshell because it's got some nutrients. Mama's left that for them. So they get a quick jump start of energy. They work their way down the leaf on the bottom to where the leaf itself joins the petiole and they chew that mid vein through, not through the leaf, but just through the mid vein. Now that milky substance can no longer flow into the leaf, et voila, they can eat the leaf. 
but that took eons to develop. Those are the kinds of relationships that have to build for insects to be able to use plants. Yeah. Is there anything in it for the milkweed? So the milkweed actually, it, it's that when you prune your flowering plants, do you, you prune it, it doesn't bloom on new wood or old wood. When do you prune and you get a second bloom? Or when you groom prune your plants, they tend to grow thicker and more compact. So it's doing that for the milkweed. You know, when even if a, a monarch caterpillar strips every single leaf off the milkweed, the milkweed doesn't die. It still can grow and it grows more and it grows thicker okay. and it grows better. Okay. So yeah, it's it's something that gardeners have learned over the years, ways to improve the growth and health of plants, but monarchs figured this out for milkweed. Um, so giving thought to what we plant, why we plant it, what we eliminate, avoid the invasives, you know, try not to create more havoc for what's there because when invasives come in, they change the soil makeup. What they have in their leaves when they drop them is different from the natives. So those native insects may not have the time to adapt to what the new plants have in them before they're all dead. You know, I mean, it takes eons for these relationships to develop. Meantime, the beauty of not using turf grass where you put a lot of chemicals on to keep it green no matter what is then you can use more organic growing methods for the plants and trees you do have use things like bio biological inoculants rather than chemical fertilizers and herbicides and pesticides so now what you do is you create a soil environment where the fungi can grow, they can help make the plant stronger, they can help fight the soil organisms that are bad, they can help support the soil organisms that are good. I know the chapter's been working on this backyard habitat program for a while, getting ready to launch it here in the neighborhood. I mean, support that any way you can. Um, we've kind of talked about this. So, yeah. Why doesn't the woodland support wild in the lumber park? Why do they? Okay. I'll talk to you about that privately if you okay. want to have a All right. I, I work for the woodlands. I, I'm okay. not going to stand up here and tell you what so I think. I sent you a picture once. Of Fertilizer yes, and I went to three different departments and asked them, what is this? They all said, that looks like fertilizer. And I said, number one, why is it out this time of year? And number two, why is it being broadcast in such a way that it's obviously going into the street? And it was, there was no answer. It was like, we don't always control what the contractor does. Okay, that's where I have to shut my mouth. So I'll just say, I saw it again yesterday, and it's bright new landscaping. It's new yeah. Yeah. So just between you and me and nobody else listen to this, um, Bright Beach Fix and Lose are contracted. It's just like that. Yes. Can I ask a question about fungus? I thought that like three years ago I had this guy look at my trees and he was telling me about the fungus virus. And his assertion was that not only was it nutrients and stuff, but the fungus were transmitting information from tree to tree about what bad bugs were coming. Mm -hmm. And not just trees, all plants. But, well, I mean, there's more and more studies. If you really want to get your socks blown off, look up some of Suzanne Samard's uh, writings. She's the one who's coined this phrase, mother trees. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. So, yes. Hidden, hidden, hidden lights. Hidden light. I'm going to show you that book here in a minute. But, um, so, so, yes, it's partly through the fungal network. 
the theory is, and there seems to be some evidence of its being true, is that trees, trees have a certain level of uniqueness. And as they drop seeds, whether it's their pine cones or seeds or whatever it is, that if those trees, those seeds germinate and grow a tree and this fungal connection in the soil connects those two trees together, that the mother tree can actually recognize that one of her offspring trees is in this network and somehow influence shuttling nutrients and water to their offspring. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's so kind of like not just the fungus, it's the tree. It's yeah. doing the community. Yes, and there's a lot of evidence that plants that are growing in close proximity to one another that are all the same species, if the insect starts chewing on the leaf on this one, it immediately releases those, those um, pheromones, hormones, enzymes, whatever they are, chemicals into the atmosphere that the other trees smell. They, they can recognize that in the air and they start shutting down and building up other things, other chemicals in their uh, plant bodies so that if that insect moves from here to here, it immediately gets kicked away because it's like, oh, didn't want to eat that, even though it's the same species. So and they can also call insects to them too. They can send out signals to call in a predator insect of whatever is attacking them. Yeah. In the soil or above ground, it works the same way. Okay. A good way to think about it is birch groves. It's one organism. They grow for hundreds of years. Aspens. One single Aspens. 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 Not just. Yeah. Not just. They're Basically. Individual trees that communicate. Right. Yeah. Instead of it all being right. one. Okay. The aspens one are all clones. They're all one tree. Yeah. They're all one organism. It's really, they savor their own species. Yeah. Yes, they do. But I mean, so what time are we on? <laughs> Shit, we got to know. We got to get out of here. <laughs> so there are even plants that are, cannot photosynthesize that still have relationships, things like orchids. And I don't know if you've ever seen Indian pipes, you know, monoflora. Those, they absolutely rely on the fungal network to supply them their nutrients because they don't photosynthesize. So in that question, case you have to question well what is the fungus getting out of that relationship and it seems as though the answer is these actually are parasites on the fungal network because they, they can't figure out that the fungi are actually getting any payback um and how about lichens i mean this is like the symbiotic relationship to end all symbiotic relationships you know i mean there are like something like 16,000 kinds of fungi, I mean, of lichens out there because everyone is made up differently. There are usually only one algae or cyanobacteria, usually, but not always, but there could be hundreds to thousands of microscopic fungi species in one kind of lichen. So, the algae is photosynthesizing to create the carbs to feed the fungus, and the fungus is providing um, structure greenhouse for the algae to grow in. It's got um, fungi tend to be antibiotic, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, antifungal, and have some regenerative properties that they can share with the plants that they network with. So fungi can even keep bad fungi from attacking a tree because they have some antifungal properties to them. So it's so complex and so wonderful, you know, yeah, it's weird. It, it actually is weird. You, you could read for the rest of your life studies and reports and I don't think you'll ever understand fungi because I've been doing this since 1980 and it's like this is fungi and I know that much <laughs> you know so I hope we can walk out here quickly and see some fungi 
Uh, we're almost out of time, so let's make that happen here. Let me um, let me get you here. Oh, do you? I'm sorry. I thought I was supposed to be done at 12. Okay. So the last question is our fungi plants. So we used to think they were plants. We had them in that kingdom, but we realized there were too many differences. So we've moved them into their own kingdom. Uh, here's some facts about plants. Uh, for one thing, their cell walls and membranes contain cellulose. They store their energy in starch. Are they animals? Well, you know, they store their energy in glycogen mo molecules. They can't make their own food. Their membranes contain cholesterol. And then here's fungi. They can't make their own food. They have to ingest and digest. They also store their energy in glycogen mo molecules, but their cell, cell walls, in addition to cellulose, also contain chitin. What do we know about chitin? That, that hard exoskeleton of insects is made of chitin. So are your fingernails. Your fingernails are made of chitin as well. So the takeaway there is, if you want to eat mushrooms for all the wonderful nutrients they contain, even the white button mushrooms from the store, that as they grow bigger, they change the name to Portobello. Um, <laughs> if you want to eat mushrooms and get the nutrition that's available from them, you have to heat them to break down the chitin in the cell walls. So cook the darn things. You can eat raw mushrooms, of course you can, and they taste good, but they pass through your gut without you really getting any nutrients from it because your gut isn't made to break down chitin. Their membranes contain ergosterol. It's a steroid alcohol that converts to vitamin D when it's exposed to ultraviolet rays. So if you really want to eat mushrooms and get a good charge of vitamin D from it, set them out in the sun for a couple of few hours to the bulk of the day to absorb sun and convert all that ergosterol that's in it into vitamin D. You can get up to 400% more vitamin D out of a mushroom by exposing it to sunlight for several hours. And then when you cook it, that vitamin D stays in it. So you really get a lot of vitamin D. That's cool. So we don't put a dollar value on the work that fungi do. So that means it's hard for us to really give them their due. You could change that. I mean, this is an opportunity. You're a master naturalist. You're out there talking to people about the way nature works and why it's so important to us. Include this conversation. Learn more. Come to other things about mushrooms. Um, you could help make more people aware that right in their own yards, the less turf grass, the more native plants, quit using chemicals, start <clears throat> using biological inoculants, Put a half inch dressing of really local native composted mulch on your on your yard in your flower beds as a top dressing. That compost has all of those microbes in it. When you put it down, it begins to work on the soil right away to add the fungi, to add the beneficial uh, microorganisms into your soil. So you could, you could have a part in making people more aware of the need for this. And just in case you didn't know, there are at least two state laws here in Texas that prohibit your HOA or any other agency from preventing you from planting water conserving plants. So don't let them buffalo you. If you want to remove some turf grass to plant water conserving plants, you have the law behind you. E.O. Wilson said 21st century is destined to be known as the century of the environment. You know, we're 22 years in and I'm not seeing it. I'm not feeling it. So 
what can we do? What you're doing. Do what you're doing by being here. Learn what you can about beneficial ways to help the environment and talk about it. You know, every conversation you have influences someone else. And when you go out, you know, I use this example all the time. Jeff goes out and spends the morning gluing markers on storm drain inlets that say don't dump here because it flows into the waterway. When he goes home, this neighbor comes over, they're going to sit on the back porch and have a beer. And he says, you'll never believe I spent two hours this morning gluing these markers down on storm drain inlets. His neighbor's going to say, why would you do that? The conversation starts. Jeff is an opportunity to say, well, did you know most of the waterways within the Woodlands Township are listed with Texas Commission on Environmental Quality as impaired for contact recreation because of high bacteria. And the bacteria is from dog poop. If you took the top off a storm drain inlet, take that big manhole cover off and look down in there, which we do in our department at work every day, trying to figure out where all the mosquitoes are breeding. Yeah, you find a lot of stuff in there. But what we find is bag after bag after bag of dog poop. Okay, they took the time to stop and pick the dog's poop up, tie it up in a bag, and then instead of just carrying it to the nearest trash can or carrying it home and putting it in the trash can, they tossed it in the storm drain. Who does that? I mean, who does that? <laughs> So, Jeff, when his neighbor says, why in the world were you doing that? Jeff gets to talk to his neighbor. And you know what his neighbor does? He goes home and he says to his wife, you're not going to believe what Jeff did. But listen, here's what I learned about that. She goes to her friend at the next, you know, let's meet for coffee. What you do doesn't only influence the person you talk to. It influences others within their circle of influence. This is, I think of that old commercial when I was young. It was for a shampoo or something. And it was like, you tell two friends and they tell two friends and they, it, it grows exponentially. So speak up, speak out, help people understand, just like Andre said, help people realize, sure, we can always do what we always did, but guess what? We're only gonna get what we always got. If you want things to change, you have to do something different. That's where you guys are. You're in a position where you've learned enough and I hope you've learned enough to make you want to learn more so that when you talk to other people about what you do and why, hey, I, I went and spread mulch on this trail to keep it from eroding. You know, what was the point of that? You get to talk about that. Uh, I went and banded birds. Oh my God, that sounds amazing. Why would you do that? I, I went and did this. I went and did that. It, it's not just what you do. It's what you talk about after you do it. Otherwise, we end up like the line from the song by Seether that says, I am prepared now that everything's going to be fine. One day too late. And it's just as well. You know, this climate problem is accelerating at such a rate now. Finally, all of a sudden here at the 11th hour, it's like, oh, maybe we should do something. Okay, it's probably gonna be one day too late, but if we made this mess and we didn't fix it when we could, it's probably just as well. Here's my contact. Oh, these are books I recommend, Hidden Life of Trees. Um, I didn't bring that one with me. This, this is the book that's always been the local mushroom Bible, Field Guide to Texas Mushrooms. It is out of print now. You can't, I finally just Googled it the other day and found somebody who was selling it for $175. Oh, wow. I know what they have. Because it's out of print. Um, oh, well. Jerry, do you listen to Cedar? I'm sorry. I do listen to Cedar. <laughs> okay. One of my favorite groups. <laughs> do you not listen to Cedar? I do, but I'm like, 
Holy cow, I don't know much about her. She was <laughs> <laughs> I may be old, but I'm still with it. Oh, okay, yeah, well, I, I knew that. I was just that. I was just like, wow. Yeah, you know. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is one of the newest guides to mushrooms for our area. A local, David Lewis, who uh, has started a mushroom club a few years ago up in Big Thicket. Um, he's, he is terrific. He knows mushrooms like you wouldn't believe. He and the Bassettes put this book out. And as you can see, it's really heavy. It's really big. It's got a zillion mushrooms in it for the Gulf Coast states. Problem is, well, it's two problems. One is those darn lumpers and splitters are constantly changing the scientific names of everything, including mushrooms. The other is all the mushrooms in this book are listed alphabetically by scientific name. Oh, no. <laughs> so if you don't know the scientific <laughs> names, whereas the one I showed you first, the Metzler's book that you can't get anymore, what they did at least was group genus or families together so that if you, even if you're just flipping through and you say, oh, kind of look like this, you've got pages you can go back and forth and probably find what you're looking for. This one, they're not grouped in any way. They're listed alphabetically. <laughs> So and they're what, changing the names. And they change the names. So I will look it up in that book and see what it is. And then I look to see if that genus is in here. No. So they've changed the name. I look in the back. And some, some, they have the old genus name listed. And then it'll say C and it guides you to whatever new name. <laughs> yes, there is. Yes, there is. And it's fantastic. This one, fantastic fungi, I haven't. Um, if you haven't seen the movie on Netflix, I encourage you to watch it. The first, I guess, 30 minutes of it is amazing. Unless you're really into listening to a spiel to convince you that there's a value to psychedelic mushrooms for um, <laughs> medicinal purposes. The second half is all to sell that concept. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying it's bad. It's just, okay, you could tell me that in far fewer words. But the book is amazing. Yes, it has some, it's a compilation of essays by a bunch of different mushroom nerds. Um, so you would love to, to look through this if you're interested in mushrooms. If you're interested in the psilocybin, there's chapters in here. What's on the Netflix? It it's called Fantastic Fungi. Oh, same as the book. Yeah, it's, same as the book. It's phenomenal. And it the is. first 30 minutes yeah, really is just amazing. Yeah. And Not you will want to buy magic mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you can find a copy of the, this is not a new book by any means, but Audubon Society, as you well know, I'm sure, have a whole series of field guides. The field guide to mushrooms is good. So they do group things by um, morphology. So it's more like all these have veils. Okay. Yeah. All these have, I don't know, whatever, ever. Um, my complaint about this book is in the picture section, they use only common names. Well, you know, what we call something here in Texas not, may not be what they call it in New York. So you're looking for a common name that you're not going to find. Um, and then you have to key to a page number to go to the back to find the scientific name to look up something and read about it. But it's it's not a bad guide. It's, it's a good guide. It's just not the best in my opinion. But absent the Metzler's book. Who was the Susan lady that Susan you were talking about? Samard. Suzanne Samard. S-I-M-A-R-T. Yes. And she, I mean, if you just Google yeah. Mother Trees, you'll find her. Oh, okay. Oh, Mother Trees. Um, last thing I'll say before we go out is, um, so, yeah. So what would you say is the best thing For here, the best field guide is the Messler's book 
field guide to Texas mushrooms. Good luck finding it. I'm naturalist. So someone here earlier was telling me they took a picture of a mushroom and sent it in sent it into iNaturalist and it came back and said it was a mushroom. <laughs> so the problem with the, the, the iNaturalist is fantastic, but the problem is unless someone who knows mushrooms happens to be on the site and can look at it and know what it is, you're not gonna get the support you need. Yes. I have that same issue on my desk, so it's a mushroom if I take pictures. And you send me pictures of mushrooms all the time. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I had a mushroom condenser. Yeah. But anyway, I joined the Facebook mushroom identification group mm -hmm. or something, and I could post them there and say, please identify. And, uh, and then you know, 28 people come back and say, oh, this is this. And then they may get to a little argument about it. And yeah. So for just a quick sec, oh, and by the way, there's my information if you want to contact me or send me photos or something. So just FYI. There's a difference between field notes and journals. So I, this is my field notebook for mushrooms. I made myself a form and bought some blank pages and printed them off to keep notes about mushrooms. I also made this and printed them off for myself that I put a lot of details on. And when I see a mushroom I wanna collect for later identification or eating purposes, Never collect mushrooms in a plastic bag, ever, ever, ever. You end up with a bag of mushroom soup and it's not nice, trust mm -hmm. me. So either a, a wax bag or a sheet of wax paper that you can roll it in and twist the ends, or if all else fails, a paper bag. Did you get those just at the grocery store? With bags? difficulty. Wax okay. bags are going out of favor. I have to order them online most of the time now. Because I'm trying to, I was going to try those for picking up dog food. Because I don't like all the plastic. Right. So you, you can. Okay. You can. When this breaks down, it's less microplastic. So uh, my uh, picnic basket that I used to use for mushroom collecting has finally given up the ghost. The handle's loose and the side's breaking through. So what I did was I put a shoebox inside a tote bag. So why do I want that flat bottom? It's so that if I put stuff in bags and put them in here, and I pick up the bag, they don't all squish together as the bag compresses. So this is for today, my mushroom collecting, and I am determined we are gonna put mushrooms in here. Okay. Um, but out there, if I was doing this for real, if it was, we were out there on a mushroom hunt to spend some time IDing what we find, then I fill this little thing out that has all these details about where and when and what, and I rip it off and I put it in the wax bag with the mushroom so I don't have, oh shoot, where did I get that? You know, I have my notes. I have my bigger note pages. I have my blank pages that I write myself notes on. You know, it's like that. So, journaling is a whole different thing. Journaling is not about the day, the time, the weather, the plants and trees that were growing in connection, what was closest to it, what was, you know, what, what else was in the area that might be affecting what mushrooms can grow. Uh, field notes, whether you're looking at insects or plants or birds or whatever else, you, you want to collect as much stuff as you can while you're there so that later when you look back and you're trying to ID it, you've gotten home, you pulled at your field guides and you're trying to figure out what you saw. Next year, when you see that same thing, I remember I saw that, you can flip back and you say, hey, you know what, I found this the same month last year and the weather was really similar to what it is today too. You've got some real data to compare 
so that over time, it doesn't matter what it is you're looking at or looking for, you can begin to build your own database of information about it so that you can see those seasonal trends, those weather trends. Why am I seeing this now? Last year, I saw it a month earlier than this. You know, what's going on out there? You can begin to build for yourself in your field notebook. So naturally, I have several field notebooks, depending on what I'm out there looking for that day. Yes. And actually, have, I used one of those little calendar things. So I have like the month and the days. And I use it for my garden. Yeah. Because I'm going to my garden all right in my calendar. So that next year, as I'm flipping through my calendar, I'll be like, oh, yeah, this is the time that white calendar will be showed up on this plan. For me, that's easy. It's already chronological. Kind of right. And so there's also this whole thing called phenology. It's about phenomena. There are groups that keep notes on when they see the first robin every winter, when they see the first fruit on some tree every year. It's first. It's when is the first time during the year this happens? And they keep all that data. So that's a fun thing to think about. So field notes can be whatever you want field notes to be, but make sure they're as much information, as much data as you possibly can collect so that as you move through the year after year after year, you can see patterns that maybe you wouldn't have noticed otherwise. I, I think it's a you know, a great way to learn more because pretty soon you'll begin to recognize, wow, you know, every time I see this, I notice that I'm in a grove of hickory trees. So maybe there's some relationship between this and that. I mean, you know, whatever it is, that's the great part of being a naturalist. I mean, that definition of what a naturalist is, is you closely observe. Well, Observe closely. I mean, really, let's do that. Journaling is a whole nother thing. I don't know if you brought a notebook. Uh, if we have time while we're out there, we could spend a few minutes talking about it. But in a nutshell, what I want you to think about journaling is when I saw that something out there and I realized every time I see it, it's in a grove of hickory trees. When I get home and I sit back and I reflect on what I encountered, what I experienced, what I observed today, the first question I ask myself is, well, how did that make me feel? Did that make me feel better about what I know now? Did it make me feel happier about having experienced seeing that? Was there some aspect of it that was concerning to me? Did I get worried about it? So if, if we hadn't already kind of run out of time here, what I would normally do for a journaling class is we'd take our notebooks, we'd go out, we'd find the first spot would be a comfortable shady area. We'd all sit down and for five minutes, we would do nothing but sit with our eyes closed and listen. And then at the end of five minutes, you open your eyes and you quickly write down everything you've heard. And then we talk about what did you hear and what didn't you hear? How many of you heard more than six different kinds of bird calls? How many of you heard that airplane going over? How many of you heard the crickets? You know, and we do that for all the senses. So the next one, we sit and we only look up. What do we see? Are we, are we looking at trees? Are we looking at sky? What are we looking at? We're watching for birds. The next one, we only look down. Oh my gosh, look at that crazy insect. I've never seen that. It's about learning how to use your senses. And for the brave of heart, when we get to the end, I make everybody go find a spot, push aside the leaf litter, pick up a little pinch of soil and taste it. Not everybody will or does. I do. Spit it out, but <laughs> it's amazing the, how it smells, how it tastes. So I'm not sure we have time to do all that today, 
But if you brought a notebook, I encourage you to make some notes about things you see or experience while we're out here for a few minutes. And when you get home, translate those notes into an experience for today that you want to remember so that days from now, years from now, when you're looking through your journal, oh my gosh, I remember that day. That was the day we were out with Terry and she said, oh my God, there's a stink horn. Let's go outside. Wait, hold on just one second. Real, real fast. We got a couple of um, things to do that are, um, we have two, two of our customers who have already certified. So that's mm -hmm. okay. Show off. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yay, and y'all will be getting your um, pins, Thank you. uh, pins and your badges at the same time. Yes, the, the reason we had to give that to, to today is because that's the end Jack cannot be for graduation. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Does anybody else, does anyone else going to miss graduation on next Saturday? I uh, just want to thank the three of you for doing a phenomenal job. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I also have a great appreciation for people in this room. And I do a presentation I hope you'll enjoy next Saturday. I've already given it to them just on birds, just a few different birds to say, like a Texas Gulf Coast, which I hope you'll enjoy. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And they are exactly the same. It's not a new addition. It's just um, yeah. 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 Yeah.
And, and yeah, I mean, we had to take that. We, we did it for a butterfly festival. So, how do I look up the That was fun because we had. How do I look up the recorder person here? Yeah. Let me see if I can do it. Um, it's just at 8 minutes. Um, and um, we ended up making it when the kids say, I'm going to turn it off so we can save it. You want me to get back in? But I'm going to log in as Okay. Okay. So just come to me. Okay, guys. For all those people who are out there, we're figuring out a way to record Terry while she's out there. We work three hours. Most of them have to play for but they okay. And we should be. Able to record shortly, so y'all can just stay online with us if you don't mind. We join me. Okay, but let me see if I can do it. That's okay. So, are you joining as me? Grab my hat. Are you joining as me? No, it's first to that one. So, join. Okay. Okay, let me leave the meeting. I'm going to. Me. Here, take mine and start recording, follow Terry, and I will bring this to you. Um, what you're going to do is come down here. Okay, so I'm just going to go to You'll just have to flip the screen so it shows. Well, I have two seconds to make sure I'm doing it right. That's, sorry, guys. I'm setting this down. Can you hear me? Nod your head. And you can see the parking lot. Okay, I'm going to catch up with them. Make sure you lock up. Back to fashion. On that, you can see the color of the spores, but this has already started dropping some of its spores that are clinging still to the gills. So this darn thing is already showing you that it's green spores. Aren't, it, aren't those beautiful patterns? And the spore print you make that shows you what color the spores are. Back in the day when I was doing this, almost every weekend, I would choose some really cool different papers and I'd make my spore prints on really different colors and kinds of papers. And then I'd get some of that clear fix you get for like when you do pastels and stuff, get, they had, get it at the art store and spray them so that it would last. And I put a couple of them in frames because I thought they were just so cool. If you can imagine that pattern on a piece of paper, and over the years, I kept getting talked out of my spore prints. So anyway, if you handle this with your bare hands, do not eat or smoke 
without washing your hands thoroughly first. Hmm. You probably won't kill you, but yeah. Is the little ridge on the stalk there, is that significant? Or is yes, it is. So this is one of many kinds of mushrooms that as it forms, what it is, it's, it's almost an egg shape and it's covered by what's called a universal veil, which is just the outer layer. And then as the stem begins to grow, the edge of that covering breaks. And as the mushroom gets taller and taller, this is the remnant of where it was attached. And all those speckles are the remnants of the veil itself that broke up as the mushroom got taller and bigger. So that's what those, they're re referred to as warts on the cap are the remnants of the universal veil. And the ring is also a remnant of that veil. Uh, there are some species that that ring is a dead giveaway versus something else that looks like it that doesn't have the ring. Although, depending on the age of the mushroom, this ring could have fallen apart and fallen off. So um, mushrooms are like a lot of other things in nature. Don't trust your first instinct. You really have to do a lot of work to make sure what it is. And you certainly do not want to take a chance on eating a mushroom unless you're 100% sure. So I always encourage folks to go with someone. That's it, Lepiota. Yeah. This is one of the, I had a whole family of them. And, this one was. The, and they do. They tend to grow in little, in little bunches. And they are not grouped together. They're not a cluster. They, but they do tend to grow in groups. So uh, if anybody wants this, otherwise I'm putting it back where it was. So let's see what we So your test is look on both sides as we walk and see anything that looks like it could be a fungus. Spout it out and let's take a look. How much fungus is Oh, wow. Well, this is a yeah. Um, not particularly, and it's and it's not it's just that doesn't happen here. That's usually when you bring in mulch from the big box store that came from God knows where is when you get that. So this, so this would, dead wood or leaf litter near the bases of trees are often where we're going to find fungi and especially you see the mushrooms. What is it? Uh, no, that's a different one. That is Marasmus. It's a tiny mushroom that's about as big as it's ever going to get. Um, it probably has a very useful purpose in the world, but it's so tiny, you know, who knows? What is, what is this right in here? Are we looking at the same thing? There's something right there. Too. <laughs> this is a rock. Okay. <laughs> that is the mushroom. Alrighty. That is the mushroom. Here. You could try to identify the rock. Well, it was masquerading as a mushroom. Yeah, it was. Right there. <laughs> right now but this is one that's often used um as tinder for fire starting oh. it's um really hard even dried out it almost smells like charcoal and these are babies of this so these things these shelf kind of mushrooms can grow on a tree for 
years to decades and just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And you can kind of tell how old they are the same way you tell how old this tree is. If you look at that, you can see there are rings. Mm -hmm. oh. So as it goes through the years, you can guess how many seasons old this fungus is by how many rings it has. The big one, so it looks like that one's like four or smaller rings. <laughs> yeah, all, each line, you look at the small lines, not the broad. Look at how many of those there are. So I think there's five. Hey, hey Terry, here. there's some lichen right here. Okay. On this branch. Let me put my glasses on. What did I do with my glasses? They were on your shirt. Yeah. They were on my shirt, but they're on the ground somewhere. Here. Mm -hmm. Hey everyone, look on the ground for Terry's glasses. Oh wait, I see them. I see them. They're right there. I see them. Oh, 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 wow. I do. So let's see. Okay, can't put my glasses. Yeah. All right, if you look at this really, really closely, see these little black dots? Uh -huh. That's one kind of lichen. See those little black dots? Okay. That's one kind of lichen. See this crusty green? That's one kind of lichen. See this more leafy green? That's one kind of lichen. Here's some more kind of lichen. Here's the more kind of lichen. <laughs> you did. So, remember, I said there were something like 16,000 different kinds of lichens. Nope, this is a different one. This is an even fluffier leaf type lichen. Here's a different crust type lichen. Look, it's got um, little what? Ferns, what are ferns? No, no, the, the reproductive part on the fern. Okay. Let's see those. Yeah. Yeah, this, this is terrific. And I'll bet you if we could peel off this. Yeah, I'm just curious what this mentioned earlier. So this would go off the whole I was just wondering that if there are toaster, is it just. Well, I was hoping we'd see some of that. Oh, look, barbell stage is something. Oh, wow. I was hoping we would see some fungal growth underneath the bark, but we'll look another place. For that. Are these teeny pots? Is that one kind of like? Yes. Okay. There's some kind of rusty yeah. color thing. And then there's the crusty one. More lichen. Cool. More lichen. I'm kind of liking that. Huh? Wow. Okay, who said, who said something else? Here's a brown, the brown one. Oh, okay. That was laying on face yeah. down. Yeah. So that, yes, that is a lichen. So they've like so kind of there's discovered more, something over there. There's more over here that I got, but I don't know if it's the same or what they see. What do you got? More of the practice from guys. These are a different kind of um, in the family polypores. So these don't have gills, and they're even though they're tiny, they you got them under a really good magnifying glass. You might be able to see there are pores. There are openings. On the bottom, rather than kill. Uh, these are um, they're hardworking decomposers. Um, they wouldn't be of real value to consider as an edible, but depending on the species, they may be one that's used for medicinal purposes. Somebody's part of a backbone. Yeah. So this more looks like this more looks like one of the rots, like oh, a dry rot. Yep, there's one coming up. 
Interesting. I don't Where know. Where he just got that from no. white stuff down. Okay, well, then that's going to be the fungal growth. Okay. Where you see that white stuff is going to be the fungus that's growing in there. Take a look right there where you picked that log up. What are you guys finding? Oh. Oh. Little bitty guys. Okay, let's take a look. Yes, it is. Are they the clinical pictures? Yeah. 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 So, so, my so this is in the... a puffball. Oh, okay. okay. It's, it's in the family Lycoperdon, which roughly translates to wolf's fart. <laughs> because when the spores inside get mature, an opening happens in the top of the ball and if you tap it it puffs out that green powdery looking stuff it's you know your temptation is to shake the kids and say hey look at this and touch it Just don't do that because if you breathe those spores in if you're too close and you breathe those spores in they can literally grow in your lungs and it's not a good thing so when puff balls are brand new fresh brand new and the inside is completely white and about the good to eat. But if there's any color, if there's any stringiness, if there's anything other than a smooth, like cream cheese inside, they probably won't kill you. But a few days of diarrhea and vomiting may make you wish you died. Hey, Terry, did you tell him your good quote about if you want to eat a mushroom, what to do? Yeah, so what Bobby is saying is if you feel absolutely certain you have found an edible mushroom and you're willing to take it home and cook it, only cook a small bit of it and only eat a small bit of it to make sure people have sensitivities to all kinds of things. Some people can't eat strawberries, some people can't eat tomatoes, you know. So only eat a very small amount the first time to make sure how you react to it, but always save some of the raw mushroom for the emergency room just in case so if you have if you begin to get very ill you might want to take that mushroom go to the emergency room and say i ate this and they can id it and tell you whether death is imminent or do you just need <laughs> yeah, just that's that. my favorite quote if you're gonna eat a mushroom pick two also, one to eat email you because it'll take take the <laughs> okay so lisa is saying for me to comment to you something I said earlier in the morning, and that is there's this saying that says there are old mushroom hunters and there are bold mushroom hunters, but there are no old, bold mushroom hunters. So, you know, use your common sense unless you're with someone that you trust knows or unless you have reason to believe you're 100% sure, buy them from the store. Just trust me on that. I remember that from our Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's something you never it's something you never forget. You never forget. So these polypores, this one's a little bit bigger so that you can see that it doesn't have gills, it has pores instead that hold the spores on the bottom. These are super hard working decomposers. Oh, it might be a tiny coral. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're just the, generically called polypores because they have a lot of pores on the bottom. Anybody else find something to look at? I think I got a Well, yeah, because you know, sometimes you step on them or whatever, and they take everywhere. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. That will make it 
mushrooms in here. I was hoping we were going to see more than this. I was hoping after our recent rain, we were just going to have all kinds of interesting mushrooms to look at. Let's see if we can head over to that big dead bar. There's something over there. Which dead log were you pointing to? <laughs> oh, this way. Oh, okay. So after just having Andre's talk, are we supposed to be walking single file or, uh, or in a slot or spread out? Yeah. In um, Asian culture, they're called wood ears. They are a good edible mushroom. They're very rubbery though. So you oh, usually yeah. chop them up small and mix them with something else as you cook them. The beauty of wood ears is you can pull them. You can let them dry out until they're crispy, grit or dry. Keep them in a bag. And then when you want to eat them, drop them in a bowl of hot water for 20, 30 minutes and then chop them up and eat them. They rehydrate. But these are auricularia auricula. <laughs> oh my gosh, those are beautiful. Okay, hold it for me because I need to put my glasses on. Where's the one? They're more purpley than me. So this one. If you could get close enough to look at it, it has this very velvety bottom to it and this little cup on the top. I'll have to look up the name of it. I can't remember it off the top. I have an old brain now. So but this is this is wood ears. But look at this guy. Isn't that a beauty? Yeah. Here's another polypore. What are you finding? Wood ears, wood ears, auricularia, auricularia. Oh, so this is Panis crinitis that you're finding over there. It's not an edible, but it has. So this, all this hairiness on top is how it breaks down the veil that was over it as it emerged. So this is Panis crinitis. It's not edible. They get big. Yeah. They can get this big. It, this one is starting to dry, so it's pulling yeah, itself in. But the bigger ones are are more round, and they can get quite large. But it's one of my favorites because it's just so interesting looking. Yeah. Are some of those over there bigger than this one? No, some of them very similar. Diana, yeah. I'll are some it. of those over there still open out? Yeah. Okay. They want to get wide open. Oh, yeah. Here's one starting to dry out on this log. These are Yeah. So, what are those? Did she say? Spanish granitis? I think the same thing as what we saw. Harry, there's some interesting ones right here. They're triangle? They're triangle. Are they the same? 
You know, those are just starting to dry up you like this. Right? Okay. Yeah. So they're starting to dry up and they're curling up, and it just happens that they look triangular. It's still the same pattern. Oh, there's so much. There's so much. I know enough. I know the pattern. Yeah. Okay. 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 Did y'all find anything in here? Okay. Yeah. She was coming into this log hoping to find some uh, unique stuff. Yeah, I wonder if we could peel off some bark and see some fungal growth under here. Yeah, so see when I peel off some of this dead bark, this white that's underneath here is the fungal growth. And there's some white along there that looks like it's a fungal growth. Now, what is happening here with all this pile of what looks like sawdust? Uh, it's a beetle. 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 Pine beetle? Probably. Or pine borer? I don't know. Oh, pine my. Tree. So these are, see these tiny little yellow dots? Yeah. These are slime molds. They're not, they're molds. They're not actually fungi. But oh my gosh, are they interesting? They can move. Oh, they're, weird. they're very weird. They're there are so mold. few people studying oh. slime molds oh, that it's no. incredible. But oh my gosh, what an interesting thing they are. They can move around. Good find. Hmm. Yeah, at last year's conference, they had a whole thing on slime molds oh, of how to grow, God. how to grow them in your yeah. house, and then look at them so you can look at them in a the microscope because you got to see how pretty they are. Mm. They're amazing. Well, we, a lot of Trinidad, a lot of it, it's, they're all over here. They're yeah. they're, they're dried out. It probably is a cheap cash. Is that what that is? Yeah. Oh, I love that. Oh, wow. So what is that? Ask Adrian. So it eats plants. It eats plants, but are those grinding teeth? Are those masticating teeth? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Possibly, or it can. If there's a possibility, it can be coyote. I guess I don't know what the molars of a coyote look like. I can tell you for a fact we are not going to find as many mushrooms on pine that's down as we will on hardwoods that are down. So unless you see something over there, Jeff, okay. I see someone waving. Let's go this way. Could you go on all my mushroom walks with me so you can baby oyster mushrooms oh. so these if they were bigger would be edible and would be wonderful to eat and this tree will probably grow more up and down its length over time but this is Pleurotus ostriatus oyster mushrooms so great find um, they don't dry really well, so when you find them uh, in a quantity and size that are worth taking home to slice up and eat, um, do it right away, unless you have time to put them out in the sun for a few hours. And where were they? Right here yeah. at the base of that tree. There, um, there's, there's no evidence of others right now, but, you know, it takes them a few days to get going, so they have a nice gill pattern. Yeah, 
great edibles. What are they? They do that periodically to prevent a forest fire. I think it was in July. I just remember, it took a hundred hours of field work to get this one. Now, what would have been um, well, if we had found a tree full of oyster mushrooms, you'd have to fight me for them. Got it. So, okay, and what are these? Oh, you wanted this back? No. Nope. Anybody? Anybody? Oh, it, that's cool. You get to show off. What are these? Oh, I have no idea. Oh, you just said it. 20 minutes ago with mom no no this oh. is this is another one this is a cousin to that other one no this is a mushroom and it's the kind that is the woody shell, and shell 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 it's another shell and mushroom. it's got white on the underside it's got white on the underside it has that characteristic white edge on the top and if you look at the patterning oh. of the top what does it look like? Turkey tails. Turkey tails. I was going to say that. Trimides, Trimides versicolor. Um, so this, actually, Trimides versicolor. Um, your friend of mine, Paula Stamets, who has literally hundreds of patents on ways to use mushrooms and their parts, has a patent on this because it is used in... Okay. Curing and preventing breast cancer. Wow. That taxol that, that, that you yeah, use to, yeah. to treat breast cancer. Turkey tail mushrooms. Wow. Wow. So these will dry. They won't hold all their colors. And in, and in different times of year, the colors even are more distinct. And they may be lighter, darker bands. Some of them even may look oranger then brown so they're the reason they're called bursa color is they are all different colors and, and looks of them i had one at my house my old house that had like this purplish and reddish and it was really i've seen them where they had some greens yes usually the green and means it's um, been overgrown by some oh, other thing okay uh, um, possibly a, a moss or Something like a an algae. Yeah. No, yeah. it's, no, it's no. not big enough There's, to keep. Okay. Hang on, Joe. Right. Look at this. This was like a bouquet. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, that was in my yard. Yeah. yeah. Was on a so, um, you know, if anybody wants to, that conversation we had way earlier this morning that I said there are only three kinds of mushrooms I let people taste raw, mm -hmm. this would be one that I would let you take a tiny piece. Put it on the tip of your tongue and kind of chop, chop with your teeth. And then spit it out just to see what it tastes like. But it's a great tasting mushroom. It's a really great taste. Tiny little piece. Just touch it with the tip of your tongue to see the taste of it. And then chop, chop with your teeth and then spit it out. It doesn't matter how far in you're sucking it out. You're not going to take it in your mouth. You're just going to hold it at the tip of your tongue. Yes. Terry. Terry. What? Did it taste like something or was it just. Lisa, are you watching bland? the time? It had a taste? Or it was oh, good. I was wondering, like, how did she. How do you eat her cook cheese? Hang on. That's um, It's another slime mold. And what happens is when it first appears, it appears like a bunch of tiny white bubbles all clumped together. And then they progress into this state and they can get quite long. They mostly associate with pine. The first time this was ever displayed publicly that's on record was at the 1935 World's Fair. I think it was in Chicago. 
It was advertised as hair growing on wood. But it's another terrific decomposer, Steminitis. It's it's an incredible looking thing. I, I love it. Yeah. Then some pine bark. And um, if you if you could if you could get a piece on bark, if you could get a piece on bark, it actually will dry, and it'll last for quite a little while before it completely goes away. I've got some at my house. It's on a little piece of wood. It's up. <laughs> There you go. That's really cool. Is that what you called me over here for? Yes. That was is. the steminitis? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh. No, no, no. Do you have something else over there to look at? Lisa, you got something over there? <laughs> they have messed with this before. Let me see. Y'all have, have pet yeah. Hey, guys, I'm afraid I have run us there out go. of time. Got it. Um, thank you for your attention and your interest. You have my contact information, or you can ask Carolyn and she'll give it to you. And if you take pictures of mushrooms, I would love to it's see it. It's videoing behind me. <laughs>